Hello, welcome. Welcome and Happy New Year 2017, if you can believe it. So I hope everybody had a good new year and uh, feels as optimistic and hopeful and excited as as I'm feeling about the new year. So I always love New Year's. It's just, I think it's the whole concept of a, it's a fresh start. You know, it's like a new year, a new you, and you just get to just a clean slate. I just, I really like that. So I'll be curious to hear if you guys made any New Year's resolutions, and if so, what were they? So let me know. Let me know. I'll be curious. I made, I always make a ton. But this year, my main one is that I'm getting organized. Like, if I, I feel like if I could really get that piece under control, that, that would really radically change my life because... Like, oh, I, yeah, <laughs> I just, I, uh, I struggle with that so much. So that's my goal. Okay, we've got lots of people hopping on. We've got Namal. Hi, Namal. Amethyst, Cecilia, hello. Lisa, Lauren, Helene, Sharon, Simeon, Wise Tech. Loving the silent treatment. Dora. Lauren, I love that. She says, my New Year's resolution is to love myself. That's awesome. That's a great one. Like really, it all just starts with that. You know, like if we can get that piece of the puzzle in place, then so many other things just really fall into place. Let's see. Helene says, I have a question I've been struggling with. How do you deal with the guilt of how you reacted after the final discard? I acted like a crazy person and begged him back and then acted so angry. I think you have, I think the answer is uh, patience and love. Like that's how you react to yourself with that because you did the best you could at, with the situation at the time. And it's, it's fairly normal to have <laughs> that kind of a reaction to, it's, it's normal to have a crazy reaction to a crazy situation. So I, I think most of us that have been in these situations at the tail end, were like, wow, who am I? I really did not like, that's not me. Like, I don't, I can't believe I said that. I can't believe I did that. I can't believe half the stuff even happened. Like it just, it, things get so crazy and so out of hand so quickly. So, um, I definitely wouldn't feel like, <laughs> I wouldn't feel guilty about your reaction towards him, especially if he was provoking a lot of it. I would try to make more peace within yourself. And just realize, just treating yourself with love, being like, you know what, I, I handled it the way I handled it, and I'm just not going to be in situations like that anymore, because it's crazy making, and I become crazy, and I don't like it, and I don't like, I don't like reacting like that, I don't like feeling like that, I don't like, I don't like any of this, like I'm just out. So... Lisa says, doing the no contact <clears throat> is so hard. I know he doesn't care and is having the time of his life. It is so hard. And it's hard, especially when you know, when you know that. And you're like, wow, this person just totally doesn't care at all. Like they're, they haven't missed a beat. I struggled with that a lot, um, both times. Like, I think probably a lot of people struggle with that. What, what helped me was to try to take that energy and really focus in, um, in the building an amazing life for myself because it, it does help to just get rid of that energy. If you can transmute it into something positive, then, then that can, that can help. Irene says, today I re remembered that my husband... Uh, when he destroyed all of my pre-relationship photos 
<clears throat> Why did he do that? Jealousy and control is most like most likely. Uh, that's photos of the, of your kids. If it was photos of anything other than him, you know, it could be for any number of reasons. It could be for power and control. It could be generally everything boils down to power and control. But it's uh, maybe to provoke a reaction, maybe to make a point, um, maybe to just kind of establish dominance that he's going to be the number one thing in your life. Mm, Susan says, I'm in the middle of this craziness. I just found you three days ago. You are a stability. My husband left me four weeks ago for a cocktail waitress that is 25 years younger. Well, Susan, I'm glad that you're here. And if you haven't already joined this support group, I would highly recommend it. It That helps tremendously just hearing, getting the support from other people that have been there, done that around the clock. Uh, so you can find out more info about that. My website's thriveafterabuse.com and my, uh, oh gosh, I was yanked my microphone out of my, out here. Um, and the links to my different support groups and stuff are there. And let's see, but just so you know that him leaving you for this younger woman, it has nothing to do with you. It has nothing to do with her. It has everything to do with him. And, you know, sometimes narcissistic people, they don't target people. They target supply. So it's whatever he is hoping to get from her, whether it's maybe she thinks, you know, it makes him feel like a big, strong man because she looks up to him. Uh, he, you know, who, who generally it's like attention, affection. Um, they use people for sex, for money, for social status, for public image, for like any number of things. But it's just the, they go through people like Kleenex and it's incredibly, incredibly, incredibly painful, but it's not, it's not you. Normal people don't treat other people like that and they don't, they don't um, destroy other people like that either. Yeah, Helene says, you could be a supermodel and the smartest and kindest person in the world and they are still searching. Yes, exactly, exactly. It's just, it's never enough for them. And it's, we, those of us that have gotten involved with them, you know, we just kind of gotten caught in, got tangled up with them, but even though it feels incredibly personal, it's, it's not, it's just, it's who they are. And unfortunately for the rest of us, it's sort of like the old saying goes, you know, wherever you go, there you are. And so they bring themselves wherever they go, which when people, people often ask this, they're like, they're, one of their biggest fears is what if I'm really the problem? And what if, what if they really do move on and this next relationship is they're going to live happily ever after and they're going to totally change for this other person. And the reality is change really doesn't happen that way. It doesn't happen that fast. And we're talking like major deep character issues. You know, it's, it's, it's so that are, that are driven by a sense of like justification and, and entitlement. And that stuff doesn't go away overnight. It's has nothing to do with the new person. Um, you know, it's, they've got a lot of like really deep seated problematic behavior within themselves and they will continue bringing that to relationship after relationship after relationship until they get a handle on that. And unfortunately, most of them, because they don't think that they have a problem, it's everybody else. They never get a handle on it. They don't ever even see it, let alone begin to get a handle on it because they don't, you know, they don't think that it's them. It's always everybody else's fault. Hey, Evie says, I'm so happy to be here. You guys and Dana help so much. It's my birthday and I'm glad to be here. Well, happy birthday. Yay, you. I hope you're doing something fun. So, 
Uh, Helene says, I have tons of fleas. Ugh. I tend to get snappy with people easily. So for those of you that are not familiar with the term fleas, it's a term that means kind of like the bad behaviors that people pick up generally in either as coping mechanisms or just as behaviors if in an environment. So it's not uncommon for a person to be in a relationship with or any type of dynamic with a narcissist or any other type of highly problematic person and to pick up beha like problematic behaviors along the way, especially as a way of, of coping with that relationship or with that environment. So for example, if a person's uh, raised in a home with a narcissistic parent, they might learn early on that they're not they're not entitled, they're not able to express their feelings, especially feelings of like anger or hurt or sadness, right? Very common. So instead of being able to express those emotions, they might um, become very passive aggressive, like uh, stomping around or, um, you know, burning dinner or coming home late or um, cutting or um, doing, doing something to, to get those feelings out in a way that's, that is allowed in their home environment. So a lot of people find when they get out of these environments, because that, that kind of problematic, those problematic coping me methods are normal for that kind of a situation. But then when they get out of that environment, it's, the realization of, oh my gosh, like, what am I doing? Like I, I'm, you know, I'm yelling at somebody or I'm, you know, finding myself, um, I don't know, doing no, like any, any, any type of problematic behavior that they don't normally do or that they never did before. The difference between like fleas and like personality disorder stuff is fleas is it can, they can be treated, right? So if you can spot the problematic behavior within you and you're like, this is not who I want to be, like this is, no. Then you can start working on it. Deeper seated stuff, because a lot of people are concerned like, oh no, what if I really have a personality disorder? What if I am the narcissist? Like I'm really behaving in ways that are, I, I don't want to, I don't want to be doing what I'm doing. Like I don't want to have to cheat or lie or steal or like, doing any of this stuff that they were kind of doing. And um, if you see a problem with your behavior, then that's half the problem. So then you can actually work towards replacing it with behavior that does feel more in alignment with who you are. But it does take time. But awareness is a huge first step. Phil asks... Dana, can you explain one more time in detail what a normal person isn't and the things a narcissist does? Um, much thanks. I need to find all the things my dad has done for court. Well, normal people, normal people don't go around destroying other people. Um, you know, I, I guess I like, I get hung up on the term normal. I know I just used it, but I, I get hung up on the term normal because that's such a relative term. I prefer the term like healthy. Um, you know, healthy people, they have open, honest, sincere, solutions-oriented communication. They treat other people with dignity and respect. Uh, you know, there's that foundation of honesty and trust with them. With problematic people, it's the exact opposite. There's, you know, there's dishonesty, there's a lack of dignity, there's a lack of respect, there's manipulation, there's abuse, there's, you know, um, all kinds of problematic behavior. If you're going to court, keep in mind that it's going to be very much kind of this, um, you know, he said, she said kind of, or in, I guess in your, your case, he said, he said dynamic where you're going to have to really prove your case and that can be incredibly difficult. So I would encourage you to try to get as much in writing, like through emails, through text messages, 
uh, paper trail in general. So like, you know, voicemails, um, you know, screenshots of a Facebook profile, kind of whatever you're seeing that they're doing that you can kind of establish, like this is what's really going on behind the scenes. Um, let's see. Uh, Dinah says, can a person be a magnet for narcissists? I seem to attract a lot of them, never ever seeking them out, but they sure find me. I've gone no contact with three narcissists over the past few years. Uh, you know, I think narcissistic people, remember because we were just talking like narcissistic people, they don't target people, they target supply. And for those of us that do come across as like kind, compassionate, caring, empathetic, all of that to them, they see that as a weakness. And so they're like, ah, bingo. I bet that person's going to be easy to exploit or use or abuse. So I, th I think in some way we are kind of a magnet for problematic people. I definitely like have had my fair share of them as well. And especially now that I'm, I'm, I'm aware of more of like the behavior before I I didn't, I just didn't see the behavior until it was like really, really extreme, like lifetime TV movie extreme. Now I see it much earlier on and, um, I steer clear. I guess, you know, the way, the way I look at it is we really, you know, I'm not going to change who I am and I would encourage you to not change who you are either. So with that said, like we can't really control who we attract. Like we're all going to attract the wide range of people. I, I refer to this often as it's sort of like leaving your front door open. You know, any number of people or animals or what have you can walk through that door. I mean, you could get stray cats, you could get your neighbor, you could get a dog, you could get a bird, you know, crickets, you know, ants, like any, any number of things can come through that door if that door is wide open. It's more important if you're going to leave, you know, if you're going to, people are going to come and go out of your life is what I'm saying. So it's more important for us to be able to discern what, where our standards are in all of this and like what healthy, like what we need, like what healthy behavior is for us, like what empowering behavior is, like kind of what, like what the people that we want to be around, you know? And so once we have a better idea of like who we are, and what we want in our life, then it makes it a lot easier to get the problematic people out when they start coming through the door and to not be freaked out and think, oh no, I must be this, this magnet for them. Because honestly, the, the best, the only real repellent for uh, narcissists is really strong boundaries. And I think a lot of people will continue to keep them in their life because they don't want to be rude. And a lot of, and myself included, like, it was sort of like, well, okay, I'm seeing this problematic behavior, but I can't quite pinpoint it. I really am going to have to wait until they really do some damage before I am comfortable saying, you need to get out of my life. But unfortunately, when you're dealing with a narcissist, if you wait to that point, it's much harder to get them out. The longer, the longer they're in your life, the harder it is to get them out of your life. And um, I think for me, and I think probably for a lot of people, one of the big lessons in all of this is to go, is to, to go with your gut instinct to, to realize, okay, this is problematic behavior. I don't have to wait for things to get really bad. I can, I can get up and leave just based on a feeling I have. I don't have to worry. I don't have to justify myself to anybody. Because that's the other thing is there's going to be no shortage of people out there that are going to think, oh, you're really overreacting or you have issues because of your ex. And the reality is, no, you probably, you probably do, but you probably, uh, what you're sensing, um, 
in this new relationship has nothing to do with your ex, even if you do have issues because of them. If anything, it's like your radar is more in tune for what problematic behavior really is because you've gone through it. Whereas other people who haven't gone through it to such an extreme, it doesn't like they're still in that they're still where we were before we encountered this narcissistic person where they're thinking they're justifying all their behavior. Well, maybe it's because they were stressed or had a bad day or had too much to drink or had a bad childhood or, or what have you. They're, they're just justifying it instead of being like that all might be true, but I'm still not going to sit around here and, uh, tolerate this in my life. Mm, Andrea says it's just weird why wouldn't he leave a message or a legit email instead he starts liking my Instagram photos when he isn't even active on Instagram and a one line email that says like how are you that's it um, that's called hoovering <laughs> and that's what they do so it's Hoovering is named after the Hoover vacuum and it's where they, it's generally like seemingly innocent or like non-problematic forms of communication or contact that are designed to reopen communication with their target with the intention of like sucking the target somehow back, either back into the relationship or back into to the supply pipeline. And because a Hoover does feel so like innocent and not a big deal, like, okay, well, they said Merry Christmas or, hey, how are you? Or they liked a photo on Instagram and it kind of piques that curiosity of like, what, why are they, why are they acting like we're cool? Or why are they contacting me? Or all of these questions are going through your mind and it's designed to do that, but it's all about gaining supply. It's all, they, they they want something. So don't read, it's important that we don't project our personality and our intentions onto them. Like that's so huge because so often we're like, oh, maybe they, you know, maybe this time they're different. Maybe this time they've changed. Maybe this time, maybe they really do miss me. Maybe they, they've come to their senses and they realize they lost a good thing, right? And then if we reopen contact, or if we even just simply fall for it and we think, oh, well, what can it hurt to just say Merry Christmas back? Like, I don't want to be rude. Then that can suck a person back in. And that's what they're relying on. It's they, they just know how to hook people. So I would encourage you to block them across the board. And again, realize he's not going to like it. And he's probably going to tell, you know, other people how petty and bitter you are. And, um, it's that can be infuriating when you start getting other people around that don't get it. And then they start trying to push you back in or, you know, be like, well, gosh, that's so rude to not even say hello or to not even, you know, respond back. And it's not, it's not, we were talking, I don't remember where I was talking about this. Maybe it was in the face. No, it was on the, on a YouTube comment. And somebody had said, uh, you know, that they're at the point where like, they just ignore, they just fully ignore anything having to do with their ex. And they're like, you know what? I don't even care if it's rude. And they're like, I'm just, I'm over it. And I think that's a really good mindset to have of, yeah, you know, like you don't owe an abusive person anything. It's not rude to go no contact. It's that's all about self-protection. It's the normal consequence to abusive or problematic behavior. Let's see here. Uh, Bob says, how can I get my teenage children to understand that I was not myself in the last months before a discard? My wife made me act crazy and then turned my children against me. 
Um, do you still, are you still in contact with them? If you're still in contact with, there's a couple things. There is a book that I recommend that you can get my notes from. It's a book club book and it is called Divorce Poison. Um, I don't remember the author's name. I want to say like Richard Warshock, but I could be way off on that. If you go to my website, thriveafterabuse.com, and then go to book club and then book club notes, you can see all of the notes that I took from that book. And he, he talks a lot about that, like how to reverse um, when children have been manipulated. And one of the main things that he talks about is really focusing on trying to just keep a relationship with the children to not even discuss like the manipulation part of it, but just to focus on reconnecting and, and developing that rapport with them and to kind of plant the seeds that, you know, you are, you, you're still their dad, that you still love them and that, you know, um, you know, that what happened between you and their mother, you know, I, you wish things had been different. You wish thing that, that they hadn't been a part of all that. And, you know, and just trying to have fun, trying to have fun and bond with them in, you know, in a new way and then keeping communication open so that they know if they want to talk to you about anything that they can and that you're not going to get defensive, that you're not going to start, um, talking poorly about your ex. Read, read those notes. It's a, it's, it was a great book. Susan says, how do I get bank accounts severed and other bills without contact? Um, you can, depending on what state you live in, well, at a minimum, you can contact the bank and you can contact the bill, bill, credit card companies and see about removing your name from those accounts. I would definitely do that with your bank accounts like ASAP. You can also, if you're both on the accounts, you can, so okay, so you can see about removing your name from the accounts. You can also see about um, potentially putting a freeze on all of those accounts. And um, there is, I forget what it's called. It's something a person can file before they file for separation. There's a piece of paper that you can file that's almost like a financial separation. It's effective fairly soon. And um, you might want to contact an attorney and see if they, you know, find an attorney that has maybe you know, offers like a 30 minute consultation. See if I forget, I'd have to Google it. There's some sort of form that you can file that basically freezes everything. So any debt that they occur after a certain period of time is on them. So yeah, I think that's a good plan to try to separ to get your name off of everything as quickly as possible. And I would definitely contact an attorney and see what all needs to be done because, you know, they not, they not only don't care, but they often feel very entitled and justified in whatever actions they take because they make their former targets into the problem. And so once, you know, once a person thinks the other person's the problem, then they feel totally justified in treating them however they're going to treat them. So it's definitely something that I would act on sooner than later. Yeah, BA Recovery says... Uh, red flags of a Hoover. They act like nothing happened. A normal person would address any elephants in the room, but a narcissist will act like nothing ever happened. Yeah, it's so weird when that happens. Um, they Things could be left on really bad terms and they just come back like, hey, <laughs> how's it going? And if you bring up anything, they might even act like, what are you talking about? Or that's cr like, cause they just don't want it to them. It's inconvenient. Like it gets in their way. Like they want something. They don't want to actually resolve any, anything. So they'll either just tell you whatever you want to hear, or they'll just sidestep all of it and make it seem like you're really overreacting. But yeah, normal people don't do that. Normal people don't do any of this. Yeah, Kate says, yes, I hated that. Saying something horrible to me and then the next day 
saying, I never said that. It's so, so true. Like, until, like, there's so much clarity that comes from just learning about the term, well, learning about the terms gaslighting and projection. To me, that was just huge. It was, I, because when you're in it, and if you don't know these concepts, it's, it, it is, it's crazy. It's like, what? Like, did I, I mean, because why would a normal person lie about that? So then it does, it makes you wonder, you're like, like, maybe I had more to drink than I thought, or maybe I misremembered this, or like, am I making a big deal out of it? Because... Like what? Because they seem so certain and so convinced that this didn't happen or this didn't happen in the way that you're remembering, and that's it's crazy making. Carla says my husband is a narcissist, and I'm still with him. He minimizes my boundaries and justifies them all, and calls me crazy. It gets me so mad. How can I make myself clear? So the problem with boundaries is the challenge with boundaries, I should say, is that there, there's, there tends to be like two parts to them. Like one is setting them, like the verbal part of like asserting yourself, right? But then in order for them to really be effective, there has to be some sort of consequence. It's sort of like with a child, right? If you say, um, you know, if you... I don't know. If you don't get at least all B's on your report card, then you can't go to, I don't know. I don't even know. Then you can't play on the football team or something, right? Like, or if you come, um, here's a better example because I don't, I don't like that example. Saying to a kid, okay, if you're not home by curfew, then you're going to be grounded, right? Or and, and by grounded, I mean, I'm taking away all technology for the next 48 hours, right? There's some sort of like, if then, <laughs> like if then statement, like if you do this or if you don't do this, then this is going to happen. And in order for a child to take you seriously, sometimes they have to, you know, they have to find out like, yes, there is in fact a consequence. Like this thing will happen. Like mom's not joking around. Like she really means it. So if you're going to stay married to a highly manipulative person who doesn't respect boundaries, but there's no consequence, then it's really, there's no real motivation for him to try to respect boundaries. Like you will be forever drawing that line in the sand, right? So he, you're going to draw the line in the sand and say, I said, don't do this. And he's like, okay. And then he steps over the line in the sand and it's like, no, no, I said, like, this is a big deal for me. Don't do this. And he's like, Okay, and then two weeks later, steps over the line in the sand. And it's sort of, at that point, you have to get clear with yourself what, what needs to happen here. Because we can't change them. All you have the power over is changing you. This is not a communication issue. This is not a relationship issue. This is an individual issue that he has. So there's nothing, you can't, like, it's, you know, trying to explain the basics of an adult, of adult behavior to another adult is problematic and trying to continually explain, these are my boundaries. This is a problem. Treat me with dignity and respect. Like these are conversations that, you know, really people, they shouldn't even need to have because it's the basics of adult behavior. But if you're finding yourself trying to draw these lines and say like, I'm not okay with this and they keep stepping over your limits, then at some point you have to think about, okay, where is my line in the sand with what's workable and what's deal breaker behavior? Because it's crazy making when, if you're, if you're trying to be solutions oriented, right? And you're trying to be like, okay, hey, let's just, we're going to keep working on this. We're just going to keep working on this. But this other person doesn't care. Like they don't care about working on anything. They just want to do what they want to do. And they just want you to get off his back, right? Like he's like, I just want to live my life. And just deal, you deal, like you just deal with the consequences. That's a really hard marriage to be in. And, um, yeah. And how, how, how do you stay in something like that? 
think at that point, you're going to have to just pick and choose your battles and do what you need to do in order to stay safe and sane to the best of your ability. But I definitely, if a person's continuing, if a, if a person's continuing to, to treat you with a lack of dignity and respect, I, I would do my best as much as you possibly can to just get your ducks in a row. Because if they're disrespecting you in one area, the odds are they're disrespecting you in multiple areas. So like the, the other gal was saying, um, you know, she's trying to separate financially, that kind of stuff. I would, I don't know, if it was me, I, if, a, if I felt stuck and had to stay in a relationship or a marriage where somebody was treating me with a lack of dignity and respect, especially if they were treating me with a lack of loyalty, um, or a lack of honesty, um, I would, I would start opening up bank accounts. I would start getting my, separating my money. I would start getting them off of like the title of my car and off of my credit cards. And I would just start separating stuff because the less power they have over, cause that, I mean, you're, it can really be painting yourself into a corner, being in a relationship with somebody that, they they have no desire to work as a team because then they can up and just up and leave and they don't even look back and then you're up a creek. So that might seem kind of extreme, but for, for those of us that have gone through this personality, um, it's not extreme. Yolanda says, please help me with the cheating. My gut feeling says he is, he denies it. And you'd mentioned before you'd found like women's perfume and there'd been signs that he was cheating. So yeah, Helene says narcissists will never admit anything. No, they won't. And here's the thing with, with narcissists is they won't admit it. And then if they do admit it, they'll make it your fault. So if all of the signs point to this person's cheating, you know, like you're finding other like perfume, you're finding other objects from other women. What's the excuse? You know, of course he's going to deny it because he doesn't feel like he owes anybody the truth. I definitely wouldn't wait around for a liar or a manipulator to start being honest and on the level. Like th that's what I see and I get it cause I was there too. What I see time and time again, especially like in people that are going into like couples counseling and stuff is they still are, have, have the mentality of we're going to work as a team. We're going to be solutions oriented. We're going to get this figured out. And if you're with a person that's manipulative and they're lying and they're deceiving and they're doing all of these things, they're not invested in working as a team. They're invested in getting what they want at what, like, they don't care. They just, they don't care. It's all about them. So it's really important to see, to see that difference there. Um, and to not, to not treat it and, and to not look toward to them as, you know, any, like you, you just have to realize like if they lie, they lie and they're going to continue. They lie, they lie, they lie, they lie. They lie all the time. They lie when the truth would serve them better. If a person's a liar, and especially if they're a chronic liar, it's a huge mistake to ever think that they're telling you the truth. Like, that's ridiculous. And, you know, and of course they, they spin that and they're like, well, I, you know, I don't have a problem. You have a problem. You know, you have a trust issue. But if a person's lying to you, you don't have a trust issue. They have a lying issue. So it would be really foolish to trust a person who lies, right? So, you know, and the hard thing, the hard thing is if we're wanting to hold on to hope, hope that they are being faithful, hope that things can turn around, hope that we're somehow wrong, then we're going to get sucked in by those manipulations and we're going to continue to hold on to that hope. But it's really important that we see their actions for what they are, and then we react accordingly.
Yeah, Angela says, mine cheated once. Yeah, right. He says, so he says, but he managed to give me an STD from only one time in 12 years. Give me a break. Yes, exactly. That's the thing. Like, they will oftentimes only admit to the bare minimum that you found out. So, like, if they got somebody pregnant, even if they got, like, if they got somebody pregnant, they're like, well, you know, at first it was, they're denying, right? Like, I never cheated. I never did anything. Like, you're jealous. You're paranoid. You're insecure. And then the woman knocks on your door and she's pregnant. And then it's sort of like, well, I cheated, but it's because you were never home. And she threw herself at me and I was drunk. And it was only one time. And I want a divorce anyhow. And she never meant anything to me. Right? It's like excuse after excuse after excuse after excuse after excuse. And, you know, it's, it's lies, 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 lies. Yeah, Clock 99 says, believe them the first time when they show you deceit. Absolutely. And that's really, really what it is with... Um, this chat's going fast. Um, that's really what it is. Like, is is learning for us to have a very low tolerance for, like, what deal breaker behavior is. You know, it's I I and I get it. I see this a lot, and I and I and again, I get it. I get it. I really do. But it's so it's frustrating. Because I guess because I was there and I see so much of myself and other people and their struggle. But, you know, if a person, a lot of people struggle with, well, you know, how do I know that they're like, what if I'm wrong? Like, what if they're not a narcissist? What if they're, what if, you know, what if they just lie and cheat and siphon funds and, um, you know, are some like verbally abusive some of the time and emotionally abusive some of the time? Like, what if, but what if they're not a narcissist? And, it doesn't matter. Like it, it doesn't, it, it does not matter. That term is a pointer. That's the behavior that matters, not the term. So any one of those things, lying, cheating, siphoning funds, abuse of any kind, any one of those things, when a person really gets to the place where they, they like they value themselves, they value their life. Any one of those things is a deal breaker. But if you've been with a narcissistic person for long enough, they do such a great job at like slowly and stealthily just grinding a person down to where that kind of stuff becomes like somehow workable behavior. People are like, well, you know, this is what they went through. And I, I, you know, I think if we can just get into therapy or, you know, they can get into rehab or something can change, then this relationship can be saved. But it's, you know, if a per when a person shows you their true colors, believe them. It will save you so much time. There's, and yes, it's painful to leave, but it's going to be even more painful to stay. Uh, N.E. says, Dana, can you please talk about strategies to take in order to get through co-parenting, if you can even call it co-parenting? Right. So with narcissists it's often not co-parenting because that would imply that there's this team dynamic right like we're doing this together we're cooperating <laughs> like we're co-parenting no it's not that right that's the problem it's the opposite it's counter parenting so because it's all about power and control it's all about them having the upper hand it's all about um them winning and because it's a game that they're playing inside their head it's like it's hard for it just doesn't even make any sense it's crazy making so how can you tr I guess the, the first thing is how do you co-parent with a narcissist step one is realizing that you can't co-parent you can only counter parent because they're counter parenting so and that step two is realizing that they are playing a game it's a game of manipulation it's a game of power it's a game of control so once you realize this is what it is like this is the game like it or not which none of us do right but this is this is the game this is what we have to play so trying 
once you realize that you're playing this game, then you can start using like the power of anticipation. So then you can realize, okay, what kind of moves do they normally make? Like it's like playing chess, right? Like you have this opponent and you're like, okay, this person normally has, they open with this sequence of moves. Once you know, like this is what they normally do. So for example, they might normally drop off your child late. They might no normally make comments about your parenting or your weight or the way that you clean the house or the things that you feed your child. Once you can start anticipating their moves, then you're not going to be so caught off guard by them. Then you're going to be more inclined to be like, yep, that's exactly something that they would say. I'm totally emotionally prepared for it. And I'm also like physically prepared for it as well. So then you can start adjusting because you don't have control over them. All you have control over is you. So if you know that they normally you know, take your child out on, I don't know, Wednesday nights and they're supposed to bring them back by seven o'clock after, you know, and, and do homework and dinner and your child, they bring them back at 1030 and your child hasn't had dinner or homework or any of that. Then from there on out, making it to where you, you do something different. You pack snacks for your child. You try to feed them dinner before they go. You try to get as much homework done as possible before they go. You keep as much power and control over the situation as you possibly can to where their actions aren't ruffling your feathers. Because what much of what they're doing is to try to, they're using the child to get to you. And if you can stay gray rock through all of this and just emotionally just neutral, um, then that can really be a good strategy. Again, that book, Divorce Poison, you can, again, find notes on my website, thriveafterabuse.com. It, it has a ton of different strategies and techniques. Um, and really, it's just kind of knowing what works for them. Because a lot of narcissists, yes, they are incredibly manipulative, but they can also be easily manipulated because they're oftentimes very insecure, very, you know, they're very full of themselves. So realizing that this is a game and if you want to try to, to like quote unquote, win this game and just co-parent as best as you can with keeping your safety and your sanity and getting your child parented as best as you possibly can, given this like, you know, not ideal situation Sometimes like there's different moves that you can make, like, you know, kind of, uh, pretend, and I know it might, this might be, be like infuriating to some people, but again, it's a, it's a game. So think of it as a game. If you can do certain things like, you know, if you know that they're really insecure about something and that's making things worse for you or your child to, to, to try to like compliment them about something or to, to build them up or, um, to do something to where the kind of the tables are turned and you're making them feel good about themselves. And that'll deflect a lot of like their, hopefully like a lot of like their venom and a lot of their attacking. So a lot of it's trial and error, but I would definitely look at those notes. Lily says, teach us how to manipulate them, please. I, I would say, start by asking yourself, what do they want? Once you know what they want, that's a huge step in taking back your power and control. So at any given time, asking yourself, what do they want in this situation? Are they trying to look like a great parent? Are they trying to make me jealous? Are they trying to upset me? Are they, um, like what, what are, are they trying to make me come crawling back? Like what are, the, what is their aim here? What is their goal? What do they want? Once you can figure out that, then you can, then you start really, then it's like, okay, I get it. Like I get it. Cause you're emotionally detaching from it and you're really looking at it as a game. So a big part of that is, is to emotionally detach. So then you're seeing it like, okay, this is what they want. Like they're trying to really look like a great parent in front of their child. Um, 
you know, so either like, and it's, again, it's all trial and error, but like potentially kind of giving them that and, um, knowing that if you kind of feed their ego, that they might be more inclined to be more gracious to you down the road. Because what happens is if you're pleasant and if you're full of like style and grace, right around them, especially in front of other people, then any bad behavior that they have, first of all, it backfires because other people aren't going to believe them because they see how, you know, cool, calm and collected you are and how nice you're talking about them. And it's going to make them look like a jerk if they're saying a bunch, if they're talking a lot of trash behind your back. So just being, being very aware of like who you're talking to because, and, and how you're acting or reacting. Because ideally, if you can get to the place where you're anticipating what they're going to do, then you can shift yourself and you can emotionally detach, which takes practice. But if you can shift yourself to a place where you're not reacting, but you're responding, which means that you have, you know what, you, you know what moves they're going to make, you know how to anticipate this. And so you're, you're planning accordingly and you're not letting them knock you off balance. That's a big way. Um, Helene says, how do I stay strong after the final discard and the narcissist not hoovering? You know, I think for everybody, it's going to be different. So it just, it just depends. Like I would encourage you to circle your wagons as much as possible and then ask yourself, okay, what is going to help me to stay strong right now? Like, is it going to be to spend a lot of time with friends or with other people? Is it going to be to, to see if I can work as much as possible? Is it going to be to stay at home on, you know, at night and just like lose myself in stand up comedy, like, you know, or documentaries or something that's, I would avoid, like avoid anything that has to do with, that's going to trigger those feelings of like, you know, uh, sappy nostalgia inappropriate feelings <laughs> like avoid movies like avoid romantic comedies like focus on you know you know documentaries uh the history channel like uh, you know stand-up comedy stuff like that that you can kind of lose yourself in for however long you want and then it, you know that can help kind of get you through that time because and then i think reminding yourself too like this will pass you will not feel this level of intensity in a few months from now, even a few weeks from now, even a few days from now, like every single day, it's going to keep getting better and better because those bonds, you know, they do, they start like, like dissipating over time. So just realizing it's sort of like treating yourself as if you had the emotional flu, you know, so tripling up on your self care and you know, how would you act if you had the flu? Like you would make yourself soup and get a blanket and, you know, watch a bunch of movies and mope around the house and take a hot bath and, and all of that's okay. Like just tripling up on your self-care, reminding yourself it's not always going to be like this. You will get through this and you just, you keep moving forward. I would also encourage you to write out or somebody recommended, I think it was last week and I, freaking love this suggestion is making so my my idea was to write down a like for when you miss him or her list with all of the hurtful rotten things that they did all of the reasons that when you see that it evokes this strong emotion in you and you're like oh how could I have forgotten that like yeah this person's rotten like I don't want this in my life like this is toxic for me so something that'll wake you up right Somebody had mentioned last week, which I love, they said, do that, but make it into a video where you're talking to yourself and you're saying, this is, this is what they lied about. This is what they did. Like, so it's kind of like your, your healthiest self talking to your current self that can be incredibly, incredibly powerful 
because you can then look back when the, those, if those feelings of nostalgia kick in or that sadness kicks in, you can go back and you can watch these videos. And you may even want to make a video where you're empowering yourself and you're like, you know what? Yeah, like you feel, you feel knocked down, like you feel really low, like you feel, you know, but you can do this, like you can climb out of this, like you've been through this before, you can do this again, I believe in you, you're strong, you're powerful, you're capable and you just start, you give yourself that pep talk and when you're feeling low, even if you're not fully believing it, like you're telling yourself, like we, like as a, as a coach, right? Like you're like, you can do this in, we're going to do this and we're going to make, we're going to build an amazing life. And we're going to do this one step at a time, one day at a time. Like you got this. Then you go back and you watch that empowerment video when you're feeling like you, you're barely hanging on. And, you know, support groups can help. There's, there's lots of different things out there that can help. It's just, it's really knowing what, knowing yourself enough to know, like, what, what do you need at this point? So let's see. Yeah, that's very common. Um, Dinah says, I've been around some narcissists whose behavior has sent me into flashbacks from the behavior I encountered with my parents. I developed high anxiety and had panic attacks. That's very, very normal, very common. There is a book. Again, you can, if you go to my website, thriveafterabuse.com, go to book club. Um, it is the complex PTSD from surviving to thriving by Pete Walker. And he talks about the concept of an emotional flashback. And that concept was an absolute game changer for me. And so like what you're talking about is exactly like what he's talking about in the book. And it's so if you can kind of distance yourself emotionally from it and replace and try to replace that, um, that pain with curiosity, because it's amazing how many of us go through life having these emotional flashbacks. We don't even realize it. It's totally a game changer concept because when we feel that way, when we are triggered and have, and are having these emotional flashbacks, it's unpleasant as it is, it's also a sign that there's this unhealed wound there. And so once we can start working on that, frankly, even I think just identifying that it's a wound is goes a tremendous distance in helping to resolve a lot of those flashbacks. Super, super powerful stuff. And what's cool is you can, if when you can start seeing it in other areas of your life, um, it's just like you, I don't know, like all these pieces of the puzzle start coming together and you're like, oh my gosh, like that's why I reacted that way or that. Like, it's just, it's weird. It's weird when you start realizing that a lot of, um, a lot of like our reactions to things in life come from our subconscious. Like it, it's, I don't know, it's really bizarre. So I highly recommend reading that book or at a minimum, reading my notes on that book. And, um, and frankly, even though too, it's incredibly unpleasant, it's also in a way like your radar for problematic behavior is really like on point. So in a, in a weird way, it's kind of a good thing. Cause it's sort of like, not that you want to have high anxiety and panic attacks, but you're like, okay, you know what? I know, <laughs> like, I know when I'm around problematic behavior, like I know, like I know, like I know, <laughs> like a, with every ounce of my being, like there's no doubt in my mind what I'm experiencing. Like this is problematic and I see it. I see it coming like a mile away. All of that residual anxiety is, is just, it's all residual from past stuff, but it's, 
it's tapping into that, that current emotion, that current problematic behavior that, that triggers those emotions. I remember when I first started dating Steve and, um, I, my nightmares began kicking up again and I, and I was dreaming about Jack, not dreaming, like, like night terrors, like waking up screaming, waking up crying, waking up just profusely sweating and being like, Oh my God, I'm losing my mind. Like what is wrong with me? It, you know, is it because I have issues with, with men because of Jack? Like that was several years ago. I thought I was over that. What is this? Is it, do I have issues with commitment? Like what is all of this? And, um, and even asking other people, like, I'm ter- I'm terrified. Like I'm having all these nightmares again. I see a lot of similarities between Jack and Steve, but they were all good. What really tripped me up is it was all good qualities. It was there. I'm like, they're both Prince Charming. Like they both just seem to just fall out of the sky and just want to do nothing other than love me. And why am I terrified by that? Like, I don't want it. It was the, it just messed with my head at such a deep level. And then, um, so other people were like, no, Dana, <laughs> like he's a really nice guy. It's, you know, it's, it's you <laughs> like basically. And that was my biggest fear is cause I'm like, well, I don't want to mess up a good thing if it's my issues. Right. Like, cause here's this guy who's incredibly handsome and charming and has it all together. He fell out of the sky and he's my Prince Charming and just wants nothing other than to just love me and accept me completely. Um, and yet I can't shake this feeling that he's a problem. And of course, fast forward, he ended up being exactly like Jack and it was the, I mean, just the double life and all, just all of the nonsense and all of it. So I have learned with myself, whenever I'm in a situation that evokes a really strong emotion, especially one that's unpleasant, uh, like, you know, anger, fear, uh, anxiety, um, depression, um, insecurity, like any, anything that's like on that side of the spectrum, that that's a sign for me, uh, to slow down, to slow down and really, keep my eyes open and to examine things clearly, especially if I'm like, gosh, you know what? This person or this situation really reminds me of this other highly problematic person from my past or highly problematic situation from my past. If, if my mind is making those parallels at some point, there's a problem. And because our, we don't like think about it, right? Like our minds don't link up those two things unless it's seeing a connection that we're generally like it's that we're repressing that we're not like actively seeing seeing or wanting to see so I I would take your your feeling feelings are a really good gauge for kind of like what's going on because our our logical and critical thinking brain um is very quick to repress stuff that it doesn't want to see and because it's repressing stuff that we don't want to see but it's knowing at a deeper level that it's really there, what ends up happening, it's that cognitive dissonance and what ends up happening is confusion. And so it's that confusion of, huh, is it me or is it him or, or her? Is it, uh, you know, do, it's just that constant introspection, like, is, you know, like what's really going on and I'm really confused and, you know, I mean, they, they're acting squirrely, but is it really squirrely and could I have issues and could this person you know, they're just, they're private messaging with all the, you know, these women that they're used to date and they're doing all these, these things and they're staying out late and they're coming home with perfume and they're not answering questions and they're, you know, they're doing all this stuff, but like we're, if we're not wanting to really see that they're cheating, we're going to keep justifying their behavior. And that's problematic. And that's why it's so important that we pay attention to our feelings and slow things down to where we can see clearly. Uh, that's a good question. Helene says, how do you decipher flattery from a genuine compliment? 
Oh, Cecilia's taken off. Okay. She said, can't concentrate. Gotta log out. <laughs> good night. Okay. Good night. Happy New Year. Love you. I'll see you around. Um, uh, let's see. You go slow. You go slow with people. Uh, you know, genuine compliment is... Because sometimes it can be hard to tell, like if it is, if it's like false flattery or if it's, uh, you know, sincere. I guess it depends on like what it's based on. You know, if a person, if it's, I think with a lot of like narcissistic people, they'll compliment you in ways that they think you want to be complimented. So they might, or they're, they'll compliment you in ways that, of like what they're trying to draw your attention to. So like if they're trying to get sex... They might be like, oh, you know, you're so beautiful or like you've got this amazing body or their, their, their comments and like compliments are very focused on the physical. Um, you know, I wouldn't try to, I wouldn't necessarily read a whole lot into that time. <laughs> time is the great equalizer. Like time will tell you everything that you need to know. So if you're getting the feeling that someone is just giving you a bunch of false flattery, then just slow things down, take things back a few notches, and just start paying attention um, and, and kind of, you know, just to see. See how they act around other people, see how they continue to act around you. I definitely wouldn't, you know, don't, there's kind of the whole saying like, you know, don't let them charm the pants off of you because a lot of times that's what they're after. Like, don't let them... Don't let them charm your pants off. Don't let them charm, you know, charm you out of your wallet. These kinds of things. So they often don't waste a lot of time trying to get to what they're trying to get to. And and if again, like bound like solid boundaries and having deal breaker behavior is the best narc repellent out there. So if they realize, if you kind of nip that stuff in the bud right away, so if they're making if they're making comments to you like, oh, you know, you're, you know, boy, I can really tell you work out. Like you've got a really great body or your butt is looking good or, you know, stuff like that. If you're kind of getting that creeper vibe of shooting that down right away and just being like, you know what? I don't appreciate being talked to like that, you know, or just ending it. <laughs> like if, if I were talking to a guy in if I was single and I was talking to a guy and he like immediately went there, I would be done. Like we don't need to art. We don't need to talk about it. I don't need to even set a boundary. Like I'm just done. Cause that's not what I'm looking for. So get, getting really, really clear on what deal breaker stuff is for you. But that's a really great question. So let's see. Mm, Elise says, okay, distinguish flattery and compliments. You know, it's, you know, flattery is telling a person everything that they want to hear oftentimes and compliments tend to be more grounded in reality and very specific. So you know, like, oh, you did such a good, man, you are really good at that. Like, look at how, and then they're giving specifics, you know, like, boy, you wrote, you wrote this blog post and I really like how you captured, uh, you know, this, this feeling or that you described this one thing or, um, that was really easy to read. Like there tends to be more specifics. Flattery just tends to be more vague and more superficial. I guess is how I would differentiate it. But again, like you can kind of tell when somebody's just laying it on really thick and they're not sincere versus when somebody is saying, you know, when they're rooting you on, they're like, Hey, you know, that's a great job. Like you did great. And you know, they're giving you a sincere compliment and they're trying to support you. Oh gosh, Lakeisha. 
says, how do I answer back to a narcissistic parent that controls me and calls me names? It's, it's tough if um, they don't respect boundaries because then the ball is in your court and then you have to kind of figure out, okay, they're going to continue doing this. So at what point do I need to take some sort of action and like what needs to happen here? I can't control them. I can't make them stop calling me names, right? But what, so like, what can you do? So maybe then this is where it gets tricky. This is where it gets to be a very individual thing where it's like, okay, this is knowing yourself well enough, knowing your situation well enough, knowing this other person well enough that you're like, okay, what, where do I need to go from here? in order to keep myself safe and sane. So maybe that is instead of spending, you know, a week with them over Christmas, maybe you spend two or three days. Maybe maybe you don't spend two or three days. Maybe you spend an afternoon. Maybe you don't spend an afternoon. Maybe you call. Maybe you don't call. Maybe you text. Do you see what I'm saying? So like you kind of keep doing whatever you can do. So maybe if you're like, okay, well, I feel like I need, I have to see them or it's just going to, my whole family, it's just not going to go well. And it's going to just be this whole mess. Um, being like, okay, well, I'm going to go over there and tell them ahead of time. Well, I'm, I can only stay for a little while. I have to get back to work. And then you're putting yourself, you're keeping your power and control to where you're like, okay, I can go here and then I can leave versus having her over to your house where you're stuck. Do you see what I'm saying? And again, also kind of knowing like what are what are the common moves that she makes? What are the common names that she calls you? Um, trying to anticipate that as much as possible. Like does she call you names over the phone? Does she call you names in person? Does she try to get you alone? Like if again, if it's the holidays, does she try to get you alone in the kitchen and then call you names? And then trying, if you're going to keep contact with her, to that extent, to try to anticipate that and then avoid those situations as much as possible. If you do decide that you're like, you know what, I'm done. Like I'm tired of the eggshells. I'm tired of the abuse. I'm t- I'm just done. And you do decide that you want to go, um, you know, that the only type of relationship that you want with her is one where you guys, where you text her, right? Or you call her periodically. And then realizing too, if you're going to, if you're going to do that, there's going to be a lot of other people in your, especially in your family that are not going to agree with what you're doing. And that can be, that can be just as difficult dealing with them because in their, because if they're not the target of abuse to them, it's like, oh, well, you know what? She had a bad childhood or that's just how she is, or she has anger issues, or, you know, she's a drinker or they're going to justify her behavior. They're not going to, they're going to think that you're mean and cruel and abusive for not sticking around to be abused. And so anticipating that (laughs) as best you can emotionally and realize that if you start setting boundaries of how you will or won't be treated, that a lot of other people are not going to be okay with that. And, um, and if you're okay with that, if you're like, you know what, they can all just go take a hike for, for all you care, then realize okay that it 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 tends to be like once you start kind of like it's like pruning a tree like once you snip off these branches of like your family tree you just keep going because there's so many enablers and like other just deeply dysfunctional people that are trying to push you back in that are not going to that are not going to respect that boundary either and so at that point you can also tell them you know if if they say something like well Oh, you know, I know you're not talking to her because she's your mother. Yeah, she's your mother. You need to talk to her, right? She's not getting any younger. Or, you know what? She's on hospice now. Like, you really need to go talk to her because she's just, she's not well and she's not long for this world. And, you know, you're going to regret this. This is all the stuff that people are going to say. It's okay for you to have your boundary and then to even say something like, if they're like, well, you know what? She's family. She's your mother. To to again, anticipate people saying these things and then come up with some sort of response, like something like, 
I know, right? Like it's awful. It's awful that my, mo- my own mother treats me like this. Believe me, I wish it were different, but it's not. And so this is what I have to do. I'm not going to stick around and get abused. And then you just walk off. And you just leave them there with like their mouths hanging open because <laughs> they don't know what to say to that. They think like, oh, well, that should push you back into contact. And it doesn't. If you want to start, let's back up. Let's start with boundaries. If you want, if you think that she might be open, she probably isn't because she's calling you names. To me, like if, I mean, that's such an obvious, like no brainer. You just don't do that. Like you don't call other people names. Um, you know, something that most people master by the time that they start kindergarten. So trying to explain the basics of not even adult behavior of like behavior, like how to act appropriately in society to an adult. If they don't get it by now, like they're probably not going to get it. So you could always tell her, Hey, you know what? I'm not okay with being talked to that way. And try setting that boundary or like, you know what? It really hurts my feelings when you say that, but odds are she knows it hurts your feelings. She's saying it to hurt your feelings. Um, it's, it's just, it's, it's tough. It's tough. I don't, I wish I, I had more for you. Um, you know, there's a, there's just, there's a problem if you're having to draw boundaries with somebody who, who should know better. There's also quite a few uh, support groups out there for children of narcissistic mothers, and that might be a group, some groups. I would join a handful. I'm, always, I'm a big fan of people. Just join a handful. <laughs> like Join a handful of different support groups on this topic. You're going to find, you know, everybody resonates with different people and different groups differently. And... Um, Join a few few groups and maybe even under like a fake profile name if you're on Facebook, because even though it's a closed group, people can still see that you're a member of the group. Even though they can't see what you're posting, they can still see that you belong to the group. So to avoid that drama, you might want to just create a fake Facebook profile and then join that way. But that can be very supportive, hearing from other people that are dealing with this and, uh, potentially getting a lot of like coping strategies from them. I hope that helps. And I'm sorry you're going through that. And it's so not okay that she treats you like that. And I'm sorry. Your mother should not treat her child like that. It's just, it's so not okay to call other people names, especially your own children. I just don't, I just, what is wrong? What is wrong with people? Like, ugh. Carla says, yep, narcissists don't change. Been through this like six times with them. This time he claimed he found God and changed. Three months later, the lying, cheating, and stealing behaviors are arising. Yes. They, they uh, do. Every time they get caught, what tends to happen is they get better at hiding their behavior. And... The old, you know, like they just throw out every trick in the book. The old I found God excuse is a good one. And that can be a highly convincing one, especially if they're actually involved in a church and can get other members, you know, if they can go to the pastor with, you know, hat in hand, like, I really messed up this time. Like she's going to leave. And I just, I strayed from God, but I, I have found my way back now and, you know, please. And I just really appreciate like your, you know, your Christian kindness and, and, you know, forgiveness and, you know, you know, tear, like, like it's just also manufactured. But if a person doesn't, if they're not familiar with the manipulations, it, it, reels, totally reels them in. And, you know, especially with like a congregation and the next thing, you know, everybody in the, they're joining groups in the congregation on for like sex addiction or for like, you know, a marriage counseling or whatever. And now what they're doing is they're getting everybody rallied around them that they're somehow the victim of their own behavior or the victim of the devil. Right. And that they just need support and love and religion to save them. But I will tell you that, you know, 
like the Bible talks a lot about this kind of stuff. And the, the best hiding place for wicked behavior is behind good. So it is really, really, really important that people be able to spot problematic behavior in any type of setting. And the only way to tell if a person's truly changed is with time. Somebody had asked a while back, um, excuse me, (coughs) 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 Ah, I swallowed wrong, hold on. (coughs) 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 Maybe? Hmm. Hold on, let me see. <clears throat> hmm. Um. Oh shoot! What was I saying? <clears throat> With. <clears throat> I was talking about the church. Oh shoot! I don't remember. Oh, they were saying, you know, well, do you think that an that God? <clears throat> Let me get it. Hold on a second. I'm sorry. <clears throat> I'm not sure if that's even helping. This is like. <laughs> this like apple cinnamon tea and it's like <clears throat> greeny <laughs> with the cinnamon in it. Anyhow, somebody was asking, they're like, do you think that a that God can change a narcissist? And I, I get I I get why they are they're asking that. <clears throat> I think that a person's faith in God can, yes, can radically transform a person. However, (laughs) the person has to truly open up their heart to the God of their understanding. If, If they're not open and willing to change, if they're not open, you know, and somebody had said too, they, they really got this point good. They said, um, you know, in order for people, for God to change somebody, they have to be willing to submit to God. The problem with narcissists is that they don't submit to anybody. Like they think that they are the final authority. That's why even God can't help them because they will, they, there is no sincere desire to change. I, I really liked that answer. And, um, I think that's important, you know, to really to really be able to understand that they can do a great job at talking the talk, but when push comes to shove, they don't do a good job of walking the walk, at least not for very long. So, and a lot, you know, there's a lot of narcissistic people out there that, you know, they are, that are in the church and that are incredibly predatorial. I mean, look at all of the priests that were molesting children. And um, my own grandfather was a minister. <clears throat> and cheated on my grandmother numerous times. There, you know, concerns that he got a 15 year old girl pregnant that was in his congregation. And she was, this was back in, you know, I don't even know when, probably the 40s or 50s. And she was shipped off somewhere. And he had all kinds of problematic behavior, but he was incredibly charming. He was incredibly charismatic. And, um, you know, my poor grandmother, I don't think she had any idea that these kinds of people walked the earth and let alone, uh, you know, um, a quote unquote man of God. I can, o- I just can only imagine like the amount of gaslighting that, that she must have gone through and the, like all of it, it's sickening. Yeah, it was weird. Lisa says, I had never seen my ex of 27 years cry. On the discard, he wanted, hold on, he wanted to see if I saw his tear on his face and that it was, oh, he wanted me to see him cry and that it was affecting him. He wasn't crying and he was trying to get me to think that he was. I saw this in, in um, Jack. Like I have, I had never, not that, I mean, not that, that doesn't come to mind. I don't think I'd ever seen an adult fake cry before. And that was the weirdest thing. I just was like, you've got to be kidding me. Like I see through you. Like I see that you're fake crying. I mean, what is this? 
Like, just save it. Just save it. Like, this is not, this is a bunch of nonsense. Like, I don't even know. Like, <laughs> fail. Like, this is fail. Like, you're not going to win an award for this one at all, buddy. Ridiculous. But they try. I mean, they throw out. I mean, oh my God, all the lies I have heard. I mean, Steve told me that he would, I mean, it went from his ex had cancer to his ex was incredibly manipulative to she was abusive to she was going to use him to um, he was uh, an alcoholic to he was an addict to he was hearing voices to, I mean, just like on and on and on and just excuse after excuse after excuse after excuse and the fake crying and the suicide, the fake suicide attempts and the, um, you know, like I just took a bunch of medica- I just, you know, took a bunch of medication and I guess I'm just going to be up all night and, um, you know, it's like, well, I'm turning my phone off. So <laughs> like, I guess you're going to just, uh, be all amped up on all that medication you took and decisions, choices have consequences. Like you are so crying to the wrong person. <laughs> like I just don't even care. So <sighs> harsh, I know, but Yeah, Debbie says, it takes a long time and hard work to understand that these people just don't think like we do. It's hard to wrap your mind around that. It is. And I honestly, I think it, it takes probably years where it's like we start to kind of make sense of things. And then it's like, oh, yeah, again, like I fell for this again, like, or I didn't see this again. Like, why do, why am I continually surprised by this kind of stuff? It's just, it's, it's, people were talking earlier in the chat. It's the same, you know, it's like the Lucy and Charlie Brown. Like Lucy holds the football, Charlie Brown runs up to kick it, Lucy pulls it away. And <clears throat> that dynamic with the narcissist happens in so many different ways that just when we think, okay, I, I get it. Like I see, I'm seeing the pattern here. Like this is kind of what they do. Then they do it in another way, you know, or our eyes was probably more likely is our eyes become open to other ways that they have already been doing it. And it's then we, there's a lot of, oftentimes I think a lot of like anger and anger at ourselves for not, for falling for it again, or for, for not seeing it. And the reality is, we just don't think that way. Like it just seems, I mean, my God, it just seems like so much effort to have to put in for, for other people to be like, yeah, you know, um, you got fake names and fake phones and fake profiles and you know, you're messaging and you're doing this. And that's like, that's exhausting. Like I can barely, I have the inner, barely have the energy to like live my one life. I can't even imagine trying to keep up with like all of the nonsense and pot stirring and manipulations and triangulations and lies and all of it that I just that exhausts me even thinking of it and so and how they mess with people and just all just all of it it's just like I don't I don't get it I don't get it I don't really want to get it you know yeah so much nonsense yep yeah. Helene says it's fun for them. Uh, yeah, I think that it is. Bob says, Dana, why do they give us that narcissistic stare? What does it mean? It's the look of murder. So, that yeah, that goes by a couple different names. Like some people call it like the psychopathic stare or um, psychopathic gaze. Uh or the mask slipping. And it's, it's that moment where you truly see that lack of empathy and that lack of remorse. Like they don't care. Okay. You just really, truly realize like how disposable we are. Everybody is like, they just don't care. And 
And yeah, it's, I think oftentimes it is that look of murder because they might, well, frankly, they might be at that point. I think probably most people that have been murdered by another person, probably that's probably the look they have on their face. It's that look of like, this person's not even, like, they're not even human because it's that, it's just that look of like the light's gone out in their lives. It's that darkness. It's terrifying. It's terrifying when you're around another person that just truly doesn't care Uh, because it's just, it's. Again, it's just, it's so opposite of normal people and like how the rest of us are wired or relate to each other. <coughs> so, yeah, it's just, it's that look, total disregard is that, is what that look is. Yeah, Helene says, but the scariest thought is how sweet and normal they appear in public. Ugh, it, that's awful. That's just so awful. And that took me a long, that was probably one of the hardest things for me was to, um, to feel so incredibly victimized and like nobody else would believe me. Nobody else saw any of it. Nobody else got it. And and in fact, it was the exact opposite. Like everybody kind of minimized it. They treated it like a bad breakup. I looked like the crazy one. There was this whole smear campaign. It was just, you know, um, in, absolutely infuriating. My, I was staying with a friend at the time and, uh, she, was this real, like, no, not, she was from Ireland. Like, she was just this real no-nonsense Irish woman. And her, her father had left her mother, I think, with, like, six children. And they didn't have any type of, like, social support. Um, So they were very, very, very poor. And so she just was like, you know, when, when I started going down that path of, Get, get getting lost in like the anger or the sadness. She would tell me, she's like, Dana, you just need to shut that door and you need to not look back. She's like, don't even go there. Like, don't even open it. Don't even go there. And, <clears throat> um, that was really helpful. Like to just realize there's no, nothing's going to come from that. Like from seeing, from trying to change everybody else's opinion about him and, trying to get them to understand, like, that's a waste of time. It's so, really, seriously, like, the best use of energy, every time you find yourself getting lost in that anger or depression, um, at least initially, right, where it's, like, feels like it's consuming, is to try to just, to t- like, take your focus and put it on something else. Be like, okay, I am going to focus on pouring this energy into, like, building a good life for myself and really, like, making that work for you. It's it's a way of getting back, like, your power and control. And it really, it does, it really does help. <clears throat> Uh, somebody had mentioned which groups I recommended for like narcissistic mothers. Uh, it's been a while since um, I have had much contact with people in like the narcissistic mothers groups. But if you go on Facebook or even do a Google search for like narcissistic mothers, there's going to be a, a handful of groups that show up. Again, I would join join like five and, um, see which ones fit you best. Yeah. BA recovery says Dr. Robert Hare calls them intraspecies predators. It's so spot on. That look is like the look of a predator stalking prey. It's chilling. Absolutely. It absolutely is. There was, um, oh, I don't remember where I came across it. It was like Yahoo Answers or something. And it was a really good description. This guy kind of summed up the differences as he saw them between, mainly between like sociopaths and psychopaths. And 
he said, you know, sociopaths are more like the creepy clown. Like they have that mask on, but like they're creepy. Like you can tell there's a hidden agenda and they're predatorial, but they pretend to be something. He's like, but psychopaths, they don't care. Like there is no mask. And he called them like the detached hunter. Like they're there to just, to, uh, to be a predator and to do whatever they're going to do. And they, they just don't even care. I thought that was, that was pretty accurate. I think at the end though, <clears throat> regardless of it's a narcissist, a sociopath, a psychopath, in the end, like when that, if that mask is there, when that's, when that mask comes off, it is, it's that detached hunter of they're on a mission and they're there to hurt you and they don't even care. So it's kind of all ends the same. It's that predatorial. Yeah. Creepy, creepy, creepy. Todd says, is it safe to say that you are their drug or supply? I think it's safe to say that you're their supply. Keeping in mind that, um, you know, lots of people are their supply. There's a whole pipeline of supply. Like it's not just one, it generally it's not one person. So like if you have a narcissistic father, for example, the supply might be um, the mother, the supply, you know, your mother, his wife, <clears throat> the supply might be if, if there's children that are like the golden child, generally narcissists, their children, you have like the golden child who can do no wrong. Then you have the scapegoat who can do no right. And both of them in different ways are different sources of supply. Like they're, you know, the golden child is everything is follows in their footsteps and <clears throat> is an, is an extension of themselves. And then the scapegoat is everything that, you know, basically that they don't like, they project all of that garbage onto, uh, the scapegoat type child. Um, you know, other sort, I mean, there's just, there's so many different sources of supply, like their, their job. Um, if they're cheating, it can be other women, other men or other women. It can be, <clears throat> um, you know, public image, social status, their car, their job, their house, their what have you. So let me answer some of these questions real quick here before I forget. So Annie asks, uh, dear Dana, would you be able to tell? Okay. She says, I I'm concerned about my son-in-law. Would you be able to tell from his Facebook page if he is a narcissist? So interesting question, Annie. And <clears throat> the, uh, the answer is no. So it's not, you can tell, I mean, you can kind of tell through like a person's Facebook page if they're, uh, you know, maybe arrogant or what they tend to value, right? If there's like a lot of selfies and they're kind of like, you know, more, you know, self-focused, you can kind of get some clues. What's more telling is their behavior. And so if, and that's, what's more important, you know, labels, these things, they come and go, especially with these kinds of terms, you know, you can ask a dozen different people and you're going to get a, def a dozen different definitions of really kind of what a narcissist is or what an abusive person is, or even like what abuse is. So there's lots of, there's just lots of confusion surrounding all of this. Um, what's more important is, is to focus on the behavior and to have, to really get educated as far as the different types of abusive behavior that's out there. And there's, I think it's you know, seven main types. So there's verbal, emotional, psychological, uh, sexual, financial, spiritual, uh, physical. I'm not sure if I said physical already. So those are the different types. And then, you know, there's, I did, I just recently did a video on this on like the seven different types of abuse. So I would encourage you to watch that. And, um, once you see the behavior, you see it. And that'll tell you a, a heck of a lot more than, than pictures. So I hope that helps. Um, okay. Let's see. 
Okay, Kaz asks, there are several narcissists out there who have YouTube channels and books, and I was just wondering if you'd come across them, and if so, what you thought about them. Uh, yeah, I have, I've, I've heard of them. Um, I'm not overly, not, I wouldn't even say I'm overly familiar. I am not familiar at all with their work, by and large, because it doesn't interest me in the slightest. I, I have worked, <laughs> like, you know, I worked at a domestic violence shelter. I've had this stuff in my life in varying capacities for a very long time. I've been through it personally. I'm a psychiatric nurse. I work with a lot of personality disordered people. Um, I, I'm really, I don't care. Like I don't care because I don't care what they have to say by and large because it doesn't impact me any. So to me, it feels like, and, and I get that people, when people first kind of come to the realization about narcissists and narcissistic abuse, that they, they really want to research, they really want to dig into like the, the psyche of a narcissist. But the reality is, and, and, you know, and this is just my two cents, like you need to do what's right for you. I, there's no judgment if you are spending a lot of time like researching that. My take on it is, it does no, there is no real benefit in try, in figuring out how another person operates or their mindset behind things because um, then what are you left with at the end of the day? Like to me, it's of no value to be like, okay, now I totally have Bob figured out. Like, okay, like that doesn't, so, so what, you know? So to me, it's a lot, it's a much better use of time and energy to figure out ourselves and to figure out how to heal from this and to figure out, you know, our mindset and the damage that's done in our lives than, than it is to kind of figure out what's going through them. Because in even still, everybody's different, right? So even if a person really is a narcissist, their take on narcissistic behavior is only from their perspective. They don't speak for all narcissists. Like just like there might be commonalities between them, but they're all different because they're all people. Like they're all individuals. So, like, like, okay, I, I don't know. To me, I, I would encourage people to focus more on you, focus more on your healing. Just realize that, you know, this person, they're an abusive jerk. Like, there's not a whole lot more there. So, that's, that's my two cents on it. Not a whole lot to figure out. Um... Tyler asks, can you go over some of the terms such as fortressing, smear campaign, and gaslighting? Uh, fort okay, so fortressing is, so when people, <laughs> when people first start getting out of, out of these relationships and they realize, okay, if they ever had healthy boundaries to begin with, which the vast majority of people don't because th this kind of stuff's not taught. And it's not generally not role modeled in homes either. So most people don't have healthy boundaries. Even if they did, when you get out of a relationship with a narcissistic person, they've, they've messed with them. Like they've either, you know, ground them down to where you're like, my self-esteem is not what it was. And my self-image is terrible. And I've got all the, you know, like their whole concept of themselves is all mixed up and confused and, and turned around. There's work that needs to be done in order to get a person back in alignment with who they really are. When people start going through that process of trying to figure out like who they are, and of course boundaries are a natural consequence, not step is a better word. Consequence sounds negative. Boundaries are like a natural step when a person starts getting in, in, in tune with who they are and like how they feel and, and what they value and like where their priorities are then their, their boundaries are going to start to come out. So, you know, the more you know yourself, the more that you know what you want in your life, the more you also know what you don't want in your life. And so people, you know, they start hanging out with different people. They start making different decisions, um, you know, kind of what have you. It, it takes a while to kind of get your sea legs <laughs> when developing boundaries, especially because there's a lot of like, if, if, if you've gone through a lot of that gaslighting, which I'll cover that here in a second, it's this feeling of like 
constant confusion, constant introspection, even after that narcissistic person is not in your life. So it's the feeling of doubt. Like, is it me? Is it them? Am I, am I too sensitive? Am I too emotional? You know, do, do I have issues? Like what's really going on? And am I perceiving this accurately? And you're just kind of all over the place. And so it, it can take a little while to really regain that trust in yourself. And that takes time and that takes just slowing things down and, and turning inward and paying attention to to everything, like to the actions you're taking, the results from the actions that you're taking, um, all of it. So part of that process with like developing healthy boundaries is like I said, it's kind of like getting your sea legs or it's like Goldilocks and the three bears, right? Like she tries the different porridge and, you know, one is too cold and then one is too hot and then one is just right. And after a narcissist, it's, it's that feeling of like, this porridge is ice cold. Like I, there's not, you know, like I'm not getting fed here. Like this isn't any good. And so they do something different. And so they often swing to the opposite end, uh, which is more of like a reaction to having their boundaries so worn down over time that they swing to the opposite end and then they do what's called fortressing where it's it's this feeling of like I don't want to get hurt anymore and so I'm just going to kind of keep everybody at arm's length and I don't know who to trust and I don't know kind of what's going on and I just don't trust people. The difference between boundaries and fortressing is boundaries are, come from a place of like love, like self-love. Fortressing comes from a place of fear. Fortressing is something that it's something that I think most people go through. I went through where you're, you're just trying to navigate like what exactly like what is a healthy boundary? What does it mean? What does it really mean to just be assertive? You know, how, what is, what are appropriate ways to show my emotions? What are my, what are appropriate ways to set limits with other people? Um, besides, you know, going to, to such an extreme where, um, you know, we're cutting off anybody and everybody. And of course, not to say that this doesn't mean that if the person's highly problematic that, you know, like they, you don't cut them off because that's totally up to you. It's totally fine. Uh, the healthier you get too, the the less tolerance you'll find that you have for anything not only like abusive or toxic but even like anything even remotely toxic like even negative people that are like chronically negative can be anything that's a drain like on your energy you'll find that you start distancing yourself from because you're just so much more in tune with like who you are and what you're about and your feelings and all that so um so yeah fortress fortressing are really tight, strict, solid boundaries that are made from a place of fear. It's a very normal part, I think, in the developing boundaries process. And, um, you know, it's part of it. So smear campaign. Smear campaign is when a person is telling lies or half-truths about another person. And they're, they're like defaming their character is basically what it is. This is different. People get this concept confused because they're like, well, people are, are accusing me of doing a smear campaign because I'm speaking out about what happened. The difference between speaking out about what happened to you and doing a smear campaign is speaking out about what happened is when you're being open and honest about your situation and what happened with the intention of you know, bringing to light abuse. A smear campaign is, you know, lies and half-truths designed to like slander or defame another person. If you can back up what you're saying, then I wouldn't, then to me, that's not a smear campaign. So, you know, like it's a big difference. Gaslighting. Gaslighting is a term that, um, comes from an old Ingrid Bergman movie, old, I think, 1944 movie called Gaslight. And it's, if you haven't seen the movie, it can be very traumatizing, uh, re-traumatizing. So I'm not sure if I'd really recommend it unless you feel like kind of healed enough to see it. But 
Uh, so spoiler alert, like if you are going to see the movie, you just close your ears. But um, in the movie, this, oh, I don't want to, I don't want to give too much of the way. She is married to a sociopath and um, who had murdered, I'm, I'm just going to, I'm going to have to give, I can't tell you how this is related without giving it away. He had murdered her aunt. And she witnessed this murder as a child. And he murdered her aunt because he was trying to steal her jewels. I think the aunt was like a famous opera singer or something. Well, he never found the jewels. So anyways, little Ingrid Bergman, I forget the name of her character. She's like, I don't know, a young child, like four, witnesses this murder. And, um, you know, fast forward like 15, 20 years, this handsome, charming stranger comes into town. He's absolutely completely taken with her. He very quickly, this whirlwind situation, um, all of this love bombing, they get married very quickly. He convinces her, you know, uh, you know, let's move in to your aunt's house. And she like reluctantly agrees. Of course, she's having, she's, you know, this is a very traumatic house for her. She doesn't want to be there. Who would want to be there? And so he's like, well, you know what? Let's move all of these belongings up into the attic that'll help. And so they do. So, cause he's trying, he, the whole time he's like lying, you know, he's a sociopath. He's like totally lying to her. He's manipulating the situation. They move everything up into the attic so he can start digging for these jewels, uh, when, you know, periodically and have the excuse that he's going through, he's going through things or what have you. And because it's an old movie, they don't have a, electric lights. They only have gas lamps like interior gas lighting so when he's upstairs digging around on with stuff um when he has the light on it causes the rest of the lights in the house to flicker and so the whole throughout the whole movie he's doing little things to she kind of stumbles across this i think a letter or something and realizes um she hasn't pieced it together yet but he's concerned that she's going to that he really is the killer and because there's this like letter that alludes to he has this like secret identity. <clears throat> and so the whole time he's moving stuff around, you know, he'll he'll he's cheating on her. He's lying. He's uh, telling her, you know, have you seen my watch? And she's like, no, what are you know, what are you talking about? And he's like, are you sure? Did you take it again? Like you keep stealing from me. And then he dumps out her purse and the watch is in there. And she's like, what? Oh, my God. You know, like, am I losing my mind? Like, I, I didn't. I, how did I, I don't remember doing this. And so he keeps doing these things to like erode um, her sanity and her perception of reality. So if she does come forward and tell the truth that this guy really is her aunt's murderer, that nobody's going to believe her. And so he does these things, like he continues to provoke these, uh, you know, push her to the edge where she's going to have like this nervous meltdown. I think he actually does do that at, at one scene. And, um, there's an old uh, chief of police who remembers this murder way back when. And he's like, I think this guy looks familiar. And he starts piecing things together and then everything gets resolved and the guy's caught. But the term gaslight comes from when she'd asked him about the flickering lamp, even though it was visibly, it was flickering. She saw it. He's like, no, what, what do you, I don't see anything like you're crazy. And so it's that like denial of another person's reality is how, the term gaslight got its name. So very, very interesting and very disturbing. Um, Bonnie just has a comment. She says, happy new year. Your videos have been so impactful in my life. And I'm so thankful for the nights I spend on YouTube with you. 2017 is a new life for me. Yay, you Bonnie. That's awesome to hear. I love that. It is. It's a new, it's a new year. It's a new chance. It's a new us. Our future is a blank slate. We can choose to fill up this year with whatever we want to fill it up with. So I love your attitude and I'm glad that uh, my videos have been so impactful. So thank you. Now oh, let's see here. Okay, I answered, there was another question from Jazzy Penny, and it was about 
um, you know, how being divorced from a narcissist and how to, how to handle it, how to handle a divorce with him. And it's, we, we talked about this a little bit earlier, but it's, you know, kind of the same. So like realizing that you're playing a game, realizing that it's going to be really hard, if not next to impossible to actually co-parent, that it's going to be more counter parenting, trying to do damage control, trying to plan ahead, trying to use the power of anticipation. You know, what kind of things does this person do? Trying to um, not paint yourself into a corner or put yourself in a situation, or I should say not let him put you in a situation to where you're backed into a corner. So her situation was he went for long periods of time without paying child support, you know, these kinds of things. Um, it, like doing kind of whatever you can, you know, if you can, it's not ideal, but this is, a, to me, this is all kind of like survival mode, right? So it's like, okay, um, then maybe it's, you know, doing something like taking out, you know, you know, raising the limits on your credit card. So if push comes to shove, you actually are able to, to put groceries on your credit card or to take out some sort of personal loan or to, um, you know, if he's, if he's not paying child support on time to see if you can get it court ordered where it's taken out directly. Um, so, you know, those, those kinds of things, anticipating, taking action, uh, not believing a word that's going to come out of his mouth and just, um, you know, trying to, to do what you can. Marie says, my new trauma therapist told me that there are no victims in love. And what if the love is just over? <laughs> what? I was telling her about an old ex before I knew all this. Not for sure my, my narcissist ex. Do you think this is victim blaming? I absolutely do. Holy guacamole. I, that's disturbing that she's a trauma therapist and doesn't realize that there are no victims in love. There absolutely are. Absolutely. Um, I don't even know what to say about that. That's just my jaw is on the ground. No, then she needs to go like spend some time at a domestic violence shelter and actually like know what she's doing because she's, she's I would imagine is re-victimizing people over and over again if that's her mentality because there absolutely are victims in love. I mean, I was um, going, th I mean, oh God, you know, there's so many stories out there where you've got like this crazed ex and who shoots his ex in the face or lights him on fire or, um, you know, m drives them to suicide or uh, what? Like, yeah, all day long. Like there's these people can cause massive amounts of damage in and create a whole trail of tears behind them. So yeah, there absolutely are. I would get a new freaking therapist and I would give her the name of my channel and come and have her come talk to me. Like just Yeah. Have have her have her come email me. If she's a trauma therapist and she doesn't understand how trauma happens in relationships, she's not good at what she does. Yeah, ouch. I know. I said it and I mean it. Um, yeah, I just really, <laughs> like, it makes me so angry. Yeah, Lily says, not all therapists are good. One of my husband's therapists thought I was trying to destroy him and that he had a compulsive disorder. Yep, he was a compulsive liar, all right. Yeah, there's just, you know, there's people that understand abuse and then there's people that don't. And 
it's pretty much a black and white thing. Like if you don't understand it, you just don't understand it. You might think you understand it. Like you might've gone over like the power and control wheel, or you might've learned about different types of trauma and maybe even like EMDR or EFT or, you know, these kinds of therapy. But it's, it's one thing, here's my thing. I really have very little, um, respect, um, credence for degrees. To me, it's not even about that. It's, I am more concerned about results because to me, like getting a degree in something is, it's interesting, but it's, if you don't have the results, like if you graduate, not knowing anything in your field or not knowing how to help get other people get results, then your degree is just a useless piece of paper. And it's, I'm, you just, it just, it makes me crazy as a society that people give so much weight to a degree. And most of the time they're just like a waste of money. So, um, it's, uh, it's about results. It's not about education. And somewhere along the line, like, I, Oh God, I remember a guy who was, I don't know if he's still on YouTube. I don't remember his name. But he had a PhD in, I don't even know, psychology. And he was, suppo- I mean, anybody can be anything on YouTube, right? Or on the internet in general. But he was saying <clears throat> that um, he, uh, something along the lines of like that victims should just need to get over it. <laughs> like, that was, his, and, I, and I just remember being like, oh my God, you really, dude, like you got cheated out of an education. Like you need to go down to the office from your university and ask for a refund because if you just spent all that time and money on a PhD and that's what you know that's sad like that's sad you got cheated out of an education because that's the equivalent of being like I have the answer to homelessness they just need to get a home like (laughs) thank you Captain Obvious like you know it's just ridiculous like the nonsense that people spout and they just don't know anything about it so to me, there's, there's the difference between like theory and application. You know, you can have, obviously, like have a PhD, PhD in psychology, but if push comes to shove and you don't know anything about abuse or anything about how to move forward from trauma or move forward from abuse, then you really don't know what you're doing. It's like the difference between reading about how to do a push-up and actually doing a push-up. Like ocean difference. It's reading about how to run a marathon and actually running a marathon. So you know, sorry, <laughs> like it just freaking sends me to the moon and back. I have met more, um, I, I just really have a serious ax to grind with a lot of, a, a lot of like mental health clinicians out there. I think a lot of them are really well intended, but It's this arrogance and ignorance that they know best when they're not looking at results. They're not following up with any of their clients. If people are dropping out of therapy after the third session, how do you know if what you're doing is actually working or if it's actually hurting people? You don't. So maybe, like, maybe you just need to sit down and, and listen to people that have actually been there, done that, and then chime in. I just, it, it just makes me nuts that people are like, oh, but CBT, CBT, it's like cognitive behavioral therapy is like, first of all, it's not rocket science. It's actually Buddhism that's been westernized into cognitive behavioral therapy, A. And then B, if you, if a person can't tell the difference between an abusive relationship and a regular relationship, any type of therapy they do is not going to be effective because you're not treating the right thing. So the whole premise the whole direction, the whole diagnosis, the whole everything is skewed and flawed from the very, from the get. So it's just frustrating. A good, don't get me wrong, a good therapist is, can be worth their weight in gold, but they can be really difficult and they can be a challenge to find. And that's the hard part. I, I, you know, because I think it can be such a challenge for people to find, this is one of the things I really encourage people to do both. If you're going to get into therapy, I think it's really helpful to also get into a support group because that way you you can have both. Like you can have these aha moments and these realizations from people that have been there and done that. Um, 
you know, the other, I forget how many hours are in a week, but the other, you know, 140 some odd, odd hours that are in a week, you can be in that support group, getting feedback, moving forward, getting validation, getting clarity, and then doing a deeper dive. If you have a good therapist that you want to do like individual therapy with, I think it's a, it really, healing really takes like that, um, ideal, ideally like a good therapist and a good support group. So, <clears throat> Uh, Ronnie, that's a really great point. He says, it, is it harder for men to find a good therapist? It, I had never thought about that before, but it probably is. It probably really is. So, you know, because again, I think there's this idea, you know, the old, let me back up, like the old power and control wheel, which I don't even remember when that came out. I want to say probably like the 60s or 70s. It basically is operating from the premise that men are abusers. <laughs> so like, and that men that claim to be a victim of abuse are somehow in denial because it's just them. Like it's really just their fault that they really are abusers. They just haven't come to terms with it yet. So that's a really problematic <laughs> like mindset to come from. So even within the power and control wheel, you know, part of, part of the wheel is the patriarchy, like men. So, you know, and I think generally it was kind of referring more towards like, um, you know, male privilege, which was a, you know, it still is a, a thing, but there's also a lot more female privilege nowadays as well. But it's, you know, back in like the fifties and sixties, you were kind of was just getting going with like, anyways, with female equal rights and, and those kinds of things. So anyways, um, so yeah, if that's kind of the premise that all, you know, men are abusers and those that don't realize that are just in denial, then that's, that's a problem. So s abuse isn't easily recognized anyhow, even when it's happening to women. So it's really probably not recognized if it's happening to men. You know, there's been, um, oh, there was like a, tw I don't know if it was a 2020 video, something like a, what would you do video? And there was, they did two scenes, two different roles. Like one where, uh, a guy was yelling at his girlfriend and then started pushing her. And their, their whole goal was to see like, what would people do? And nobody, and then finally, like when he really began getting loud and like really began getting physical, people, like a couple guys like stepped up and were like, dude, back off, you know? Um, when the roles were reversed and the woman was cussing him out, pushing, shoving, slapping, really getting physical, people were laughing. They didn't need, not only did they not step in and say anything, they had this... Uh, they everybody stepped back and let it continue and it was very much this mindset of well she must have a reason whereas if a woman abuses a man then if a woman abuses a man it's the idea that she must really have a reason for it but if a man abuses a woman then it's um obviously never justified so the shift the way i see it it's the difference between if we're, if, if we're saying that abuse is about power and control, then it's about power and control in all situations, all genders, all, you know, all shapes and sizes, all ethnicities, all religions, all nationalities, all what have you. It's not about, the confusion is people are like, oh, well, it's, you know, um, the more of a focus on like gender and strength, but it's, it's, it's abuse is not about gender or strength. It's about power and control. So, um, that is a, that is a challenge that a lot of men actually getting, getting support, getting feedback. And I would imagine to opening up because there, I would imagine there was probably a lot of this, this kind of, um, you know, I, I think anybody that goes through an abusive relationship feels a lot of like, they struggle with feelings of shame and guilt and embarrassment of kind of, how did this happen to me? Right? So I think men and women have different issues when it comes to recovering from an abusive relationship. And, um, yeah. 
So yeah, I think it would be a very real challenge for men to move forward and heal. I remember there was a thing a, uh, um, I saw on Facebook a while back. It was like the black dot campaign. Did you guys see this? Where like you put like a black, like a woman, woman again, right? Puts a black dot in the middle of her hand to signify that she's as a sign for help that you can go and, and tell people like, this is the sign that I am an abusive relationship. You have this black dot. And I remember like looking at that and thinking that that's an interesting concept, but it's not people. And maybe that would work because then they're actually listening to you being like, I need help. Here's my signal because people can't spot abuse. Like you could be, I, I mean, have you guys ever been in like a store or in public and you've got somebody that's just verbally unleashing this tirade of name calling and awfulness, like yelling and screaming at another person and nobody does anything. Everybody's mindset is like, well, it's not my business. I don't want to intrude. That's just how they are. People just have a really hard time spotting abuse in general. Mm, that's a good question, Lori. Um, ask, how should a good therapist be treating you? How would we know? What are the signs that they are doing it right? I think everybody is going to have their own take on this. And I think a good therapist is going to be able to help a good therapist in my opinion is one that can that can kind of give you the validation that you feel comfortable enough like opening up to with them <clears throat> about the truth about whatever in your life that you feel listened to that you feel heard that you feel respected that you feel safe with and um when it comes to abuse, that they understand, that's really the core. Do they, you know, do they understand the difference between a relationship and an, and an abusive relationship? That's really big. And do they understand that an abusive relationship is a lot more than just physical abuse? That there's, that all kinds of abuse are equally as damaging and that there's the seven different kinds of abuse. Uh, because again, the old, the old power and control wheel, it's on the outside of it, like kind of what's holding it all together is physical abuse. And I think that's also outdated because lots of abusive relationships are not physical. They never progress to where they get, they get physical to me. It's not, I, in my opinion, I don't think that it's physical abuse that holds the relationship together. It's the psychological abuse. And so I think that's a shift that needs to be made because what happens is a lot of people, if they're trained in that traditional power and control, that's like the only teaching tool out there. It's the only concept of abuse that's really out there. If that's how they're taught, then they're really only registering what's abusive in terms of what's life threatening. Well, like abuse goes so much more than that. And as we all know, so, um, and then I would say too, you know, are you getting, you know, how do you feel about your time when you're with that person and kind of what, what are your goals? Like, what are your goals for your time in therapy? What kind of issues are you wanting to explore? Um, you know, in what ways are you comfortable exploring them? So there's, there's so many different like individual components, components there. Um, know it's it's just it's so hard it's so hard to find uh, you know good people in, in any profession it's just sometimes you gotta go to a few before you really resonate with a person and you're like yep that's that's the one like that that's you know you just know you're like my boy you know this you you just you just know like you just know because you're getting the results that you want you you know you're 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 feeling on track, like you're feeling good when you're, you just, everything's clicking. (laughs) Like when you're, when you're with that person. So 
so one of many leaves says I work in a mental health clinic and my coworkers don't know that much about it only the overt type and even then it's a limited understanding oh totally me me too it's frustrating beyond belief It's, it's just, it's not taught. It's just not taught. It, and what is taught is very limited. And, um, you know, I've talked about this before. I really feel we are at kind of the next stage with the understandings of abuse. And a lot of it has to do with the internet. So before, like a lot of these studies and everything that was done having to do with abuse, you know, they were very limited and it was more of like the researchers making connections about this. Well, this is how things are, right? Like we are the researchers. We know best. There, there wasn't this shift to it being more patient centered or more client centered where it's actually listening to the people and being and getting enough of them in the same. And of course, too, the added challenge with that is you've got a bunch of people. You know, you could have. Yeah, you could have a thousand people in a room. You could talk to them each individually if you're talking to a thousand highly manipulated people, like you're not going to get very far because they can't articulate their experience because they don't know what the hell happened. They just know that their life is in shambles. They don't understand how they got here, but, and they don't even know that they're not even a hundred percent convinced that it's not even their fault. Like they don't know. So, you know, this is, there's a lot of uh, education and re-education that needs to be done out there. And, you know, even for me, like I, my background is working at a domestic violence shelter. Even then, I mean, I've had hundreds of hours of training specifically in abuse and crisis situations. It, what I learned was probably not even a tenth of of what I needed to really know in order to keep myself safe um, and to be able to understand what abuse was. It wasn't until I got into a support group with like thousands of other people and that they were all sharing elements of their own story that I began, it was just like this light went on. I'm like, oh my gosh, like these are all of the missing pieces. Like I get it now. And you know, because if a person doesn't know what's wrong, like what's going on, then they're fumbling around. And if they're, if they're fumbling and if they're, if they have, a, if they're with a mental health clinician that doesn't really understand it either, then it, it's like, you know, you're the blind leading the blinder. Like you're just kind of fumbling around and, um, you're just not going to get very far. So it really does help to to hear because everybody's going to be making that's what's so cool about support groups everybody's making their own connections and so then they're sharing their aha moments and they're like oh you know this one time my parent did this and you're like oh my gosh I did yeah I went through that too but I thought it was just me or like I didn't realize it was it felt problematic but I thought I was just too sensitive and these connections are being made and then it's just boom like the lights just go on and, and you can really get it So, yes, okay, fine piece says Lori. Uh, she knew that she had the right therapist once she explained to me what a sociopath is. Yes. Yes, yes, yes. And so that might be a good question to open with. If you're, if you're looking for a good therapist to call, call, call a handful of them and to just say, you know, I... I'm getting out of an abusive relationship and would you have a few minutes that I just want to make sure that we would be a good fit before you go through like setting up an appointment and you're filling out all the paperwork and then talking to them for an hour and then you realize we're not a good fit. So it's valuing yourself, valuing your own time, realizing they are people too and the training is kind of unfortunately all over the place even if they are really highly trained in, in abuse Odds are it's still like not where it needs to be. So, um, but yeah, they, it, at a minimum, knowing the damage that a sociopath or a narcissist can do is a really good start. Uh, 
Um, yeah, it's a chat. Hey, Kevin. Uh, Kevin was saying that's a good point because people have a watered down understanding of what a narcissist is. It might be better to use the term sociopath to see what they understand about it. And even, even then, the challenge with that is if people are using the terms like this person's a sociopath, it can come across like, oh, you're a bitter, bitter jaded ex. And, and I think too, what a lot of times mental health clinicians, um, they might not feel comfortable using that terminology for a wide variety of reasons. That's the other thing that really gets me. Like if you're using words to describe your experience, I think the right mental health clinician isn't going to invalidate you um, and say like, well, we don't really know if this person's a sociopath. They're not going to argue your reality. If somebody's arguing your reality with you, like you need to just get out of there. Even if you're wrong, even if this person is not a sociopath, being sociopathic is enough of a problem. Like they don't need to be full out personality disordered. Having highly problematic sociopathic behavior it's the same difference. You're splitting hairs. If they can't see that, that it's splitting hairs, there's a problem and it's just find another therapist. Um, yeah, there's just no shortage. Postmodern saying, I, I only had one psychiatrist that invalidated me and that was around my parenting skills. It had nothing to do with my ex. Yeah. Elise says, is it bad to call out narcissistic behavior? Um, will they get better at manipulating? It's generally not going to end well because <laughs> they, you know, they're probably, you're probably going to get the silent treatment and they're probably going to break up with you. They're probably going to fly into a rage you know, um, they're probably just going to get better at hiding their behavior. Y you can try it. <laughs> like you can, you can try to work towards a solution, but if you're with a person who is not solutions oriented and they're, they turn into a giant child whenever they're confronted with any relationship issues, you know, if, they, if there's gaslight, if they're denying your reality, if they're blame shifting, if they're stonewalling, if they're doing silent treatment, if they're, um, you know, breaking up with you randomly, if they're like doing any of that kind of stuff, like that's all highly problematic and that's not team behavior. <laughs> so again, like calling a person, you know, setting a boundary, calling a person out, and saying like, hey, this is not okay with me, this doesn't work for me, whatever. Asserting your boundary is step one. The next part is, what is the consequence if they keep crossing that line? So, because they're not going, they're, they're most likely not going to change. I think it's pr a pretty safe bet in life to assume that no other people in your life will ever change, <laughs> because most people don't. So knowing that, it's sort of like, okay, instead of trying to get all of this energy into trying to get them to change, what can you change to make this situation different? And ideally, where you can get to a place where you can main, like, get in alignment with yourself and maintain your peace and your sanity and your safety. And that's not dependent upon them or their actions. Yes, thank you. Postmodern says stonewalling leads to contempt. It's a refusal to discuss an issue. Yes. At least says, oh wait. Ronnie says, will they discard you at the end anyways, no matter what you do for them? There's a very solid chance um, that they will. Because it's, there's no, 
commitment. There's no, there's no like, it's like, it seriously is like dealing with a child in an adult body. So how like a child will promise, right? They're like, I really want a puppy and I will do anything that it takes to get this puppy. And I will love it and I will feed it and I will walk it and I will clean up after it. And I just, any, I just want, and they, and they might truly, truly mean it in that moment. But as soon as something else comes along, their neighbor friend wants to play, they, um, the dog gets older, right? It's not a puppy anymore. Um, that, you know, their favorite TV shows on all of a sudden, all of those, that intensity and those promises are gone and they're off to the next thing. Narcissists are very much the same way. It's just kind of, there's this, um, you know, kind of, there's a definitely a lack of commitment, but there's like a lack of depth there to, to what they're saying. It's just, it's very fleeting. It's very surface. It's very in the moment. Um, so, okay. Namal says, Dana, I sent you an email. Okay. I will check. I'm not even sure <laughs> if that email is working because somebody, so I, I will, I will, I will touch base with you either I'll find you <laughs> I'll find you in touch base and we'll, we will connect even if that email is not working it's hard because people are talking about yes it's like a child in an adult body it really it's you can't if okay if we're saying that a relationship is based off of honesty and trust and respect and dignity an open, honest, sincere, solutions-oriented communication. It's like a cake, right? So if any one of those elements are missing, there is not, there is no relationship. Just like if, if you're baking a cake and you have, you know, uh, butter and sugar and eggs and flour and water, if you're missing any one of those ingredients, you don't have a cake. You just have like a hunk of, of dough. So it's really... You, if you're in a relationship with a person who can't give you those things, any one of those things, then that relationship's never going to rise. Like it's never going to be able to be more than like a hunk of dough. And so then what happens is people that are in these relationships, they're like, okay, I have this hunk of dough. I really want it to be a cake. I don't think it'll ever be a cake. I need to come to terms with the fact that it can never be a cake. It's just not a cake. Like they're missing ingredients here. But then a person's like, okay, well, I need to figure out how to somehow be okay with eating dough and make peace with that. That's a really hard thing to do. It's, it, it's hard. And um, so it, this is where it comes down to you and knowing yourself well enough what's workable and what's deal breaker stuff. And at what point because none of us have a crystal ball. We don't know what other people are going to do. You know, where is your line in the sand for how, what kind of changes you need to see and in what kind of time frame, and then what? It's not easy. It's so, it's not easy, you know, walking away or cutting contact or um, cutting back contact or any of these things. It's definitely not easy, but then it's kind of weighing, okay, Neither of these things are easy. It's not easy to stay and it's not easy to go. So do you want the pain of going or do you want the pain of staying? Because that, that's the choice. Okay, Lily's signing off. She's putting her dream home on the market tomorrow. Oh, that's intense. Hugs to you, Lily. Hugs to you. This is the next, this is the next chapter. And I think even though it's your dream home, you're going to find that there's going to be a lot more peace with just having the energy of a brand new environment and having your own space and your own everything back. Like you can recreate this, you can rebuild. And this is going to be just this next chapter. Just please just make it, try to make it the best one yet. So hugs to you.
Yes. Oh my gosh, Nathan, that's so true. Nathan says, it's hard to stay and pretend the abuse is normal after you know. Yeah. It It is. Once you see it, it's hard to unsee it. And then it, and it's also like, it's the realization of, okay, I'm letting go of the fantasy. Like this is, this person's really, this is a problem. And this, this person's probably not going to change because they don't seem interested in seeing that there's a problem, let alone taking action to change. Bob says, my kids are almost 20 years old. I try to educate them on narcissism, but they think I'm nagging. They are struggling emotionally. So Bob, you might want to try coming at this from a totally different angle. And I would encourage you to come at it from the angle of trying to empower, empower them. So talking more about um, boundaries and paying attention, saying no, um, getting in alignment with themselves. Like you might want to use different words. I know I can sound hippie woo woo at times, but like getting into the alignment with themselves, paying attention. How do they feel when something's off for them? Um, paying attention to, you know, terms like emotional triggers or emotional flashbacks or, uh, you know, um, I don't, people just, they shut down. Like when people start talking about narcissism or abuse or whatever, it, they're just very quick to discount it. But if you can, if you can maybe try talking about it in terms of empowering them and them becoming their, their highest and best self and like kind of getting in tune with, you know, their, how are they with anger, right? How are they with expressing their emotions with anger or with hurt or, or, um, how are they with communication and, you know, being a kind of what is assertive communication and keeping communication open with you guys. And that's kind of the thing. The other thing too, is a lot of people, when they're learning about all of this and their eyes are open to it, they're like, Oh my gosh, everything totally makes sense. <laughs> like, especially within a family, you're like, I got it. Mom is a narcissist. Like, <laughs> mystery solved, mystery solved. Like you, you just, you get it right. And you get it and you really want other people to get it too. And so you're starting to call up all your siblings and like your second cousins. And you're like, I figured it out. I got it. I got it. She's a narcissist. Right. And then they're all like, what do you, they don't want to hear it. Like, no, no, no. You're, you're being drama. That's, that's too much. Or she's got issues, but I wouldn't go that far. And they, they just, they're not open to it. And so it can feel like yet another layer of like revictimization and crazy making where your eyes are open to it. Theirs aren't. And it can feel a lot like, um, the saying is, you know, trying to put lipstick on a pig. It, it just, it frustrates you and it annoys the pig. And so kind of paying attention to if people are open to hearing this, because oftentimes they're not and trying to just respect that and, and back and just back away as much as possible and maybe come at it in terms of like a positive way of kind of discussing them and, and, and trying to empower them. Yeah. Postmodern says nobody wants to hear it when you say your mother has traits of a personality disorder. Yeah. They really don't. So, okay, Sir Style Counselor. <laughs> it's a good name. You guys are so creative with these names. Um, actually, I'm going to come back to that real quick. Nathan says, my narcissist tried convincing me she'd change if I bought her a dream home and married her. Yes. Um, don't ever fall for that. <laughs> And I know like, right? you're like, well, yeah, I get that now. Like hindsight's always 20, 20, but I see this a lot. Like a lot of people are like, okay, well, you know what? If we get married, I'm going to quit drinking. If we get married, um, things are somehow going to be radically different. Well, 
when a person's all in, like when you're pot committed like that, right? When you're married, people, t- marriage, people tend to get more comfortable after, so I think, especially women tend to get more comfortable after marriage because it's sort of like, I think for a lot, and I think for a lot of women, it's just more of a social thing that that's the end prize is getting married. And so then they're like, oh, whew, okay, I got married. Yeah, check that off the list. And then it's sort of like, no, 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 the, the marriage is just the party. <laughs> like it's, it's the commitment to each other. Now, now things get real, right? Like now with, this is what it means to be married. It's not just about like the ring and the party and the big fancy dress, which I think it is for like a lot of women. So because then there's sort of like this feeling of like, well, I did it. Like I, I crossed the finish line. I got married and now I can just relax. And the opposite really should. And that's just a lot of cultural stuff that I think women are fed. But, you know, it's important that people I think and realize no 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 this is when the marathon has just started like you get married that's all the fun stuff but now now it's really game on most people though when they get married when they you know when they do that they realize this other person's not easily going anywhere they're they have no real motivation to actually change um to change so I'm so sorry that that you, that you went through all that. So yes, if you're going to marry somebody, I think it's a good idea to, to marry them for who they are today. Not who you hope they'll be, not who they promise to be, who they are today. Because if they can promise to be, and if they promise to be somebody different, I would Here's the thing. It's everything is easy to get into and it's so much harder to get out of. And so if a person's got problematic behavior, like getting married or having a baby is not a solution to that. Like really giving them time to see, are they changing? And I'm talking time, like several years before you further commit yourself to them. Like before you get married, before you buy a house, before you have children with them to really see, has this person actually changed? And I think, for, you know, again, for all, and I get it. I get it because I was there too. But like there's a lot, of, there's this push to, I just want to hurry up and start my life with this person. But that can be really problematic if we're running full steam, you know, head on into a highly problematic situation based off of hope and, and future faking and false promises. But again, this stuff is not, it's not taught and it's not taught and it's really not talked about. And so people, when they are going through this, there's oftentimes a lot of these feelings of, you know, this is like, what was I thinking? I'm so stupid. How come I didn't see these signs? I can't, I, you know, there's all this guilt and shame and embarrassment and these, all of these these negative feelings that we dump on ourselves, not realizing this happens to quite a lot of people. It's just that people don't like, we're just talking about it, <laughs> like, but it happens to a lot of people. So Lisa says, uh, I loved being married 27 years, but had no clue he was a covert narcissist. And that was so devastating to find out his double life for at least 20 of those years. I just can't wrap my mind around it. Oh my gosh. I, I can only imagine I went through something very similar, but it was only for two years. So I can only imagine the shock of 27 I have a, there's a family friend of ours who was in a very similar situation, very charming, very covert. Um, he was an alcoholic, but other than that, I mean, like, I mean, that's a huge, don't get me wrong. Like that's a huge thing. Like that can be that deal breaker stuff in and of itself, but he wasn't, he was a family man, you know, he, good husband, um, you know, seemingly great person. Well, 
his alcohol, it was, there was just a lot of stuff with his alcoholism and, um, you know, kind of, anyways, long story short, they ended up divorcing after it was about that, like 25 years or so. And it was during the, somehow, like, I don't even know, like the financial discovery period or like the, the, the initial divorce proceedings that it came out that he had not one, but two other families that our family friend knew nothing about children, the whole nine, like just never saw it coming. Totally, just totally caught off guard. It is. So you're not alone out there and it's going to take, it's going to take some time to wrap your mind around it. Right now, It's, uh, I would encourage you to focus on just tripling up on your self-care and, you know, the pieces will come together in time, but what's important right now is that you realize this is not, this is not you. His behavior is a reflection of him. It's not a reflection of you because normal people don't, don't do that. They don't have two very different sides to themselves. They, they don't have, you know, double lives and, and, in all of this, they don't do that. So he hid it very well for a very long time. And I'm, my heart goes out to you. I, it, it's its own layer of, uh, like isolation and, frustration with trying to explain this is trying to explain to other people I when I went through everything with both Jack and Steve it was almost like I would there wasn't anything really concrete I had a really hard time like pointing to concrete things and saying like this was really problematic and because I couldn't do that it was like well no they were both incredibly charming um the whole time but you know i if you're not familiar with my story the first guy I got tangled up with I'm pretty sure was either poisoning me or was intending to kill me and the whole time he had pretended to be like I thought he was one of my best friends I had I just did not see it coming at all and it wasn't until the very end and all I just happened to stumble across his double life and it was I mean then like I, I wasn't feeling well I hadn't been feeling well for like a handful of months and it just it was just on and on and on and then Fast forward like five or six years later, I ended up just coming across a drawing that he did um, and that was tucked in like a book or a magazine in my, my hope chest as a fluke. And it was a picture of me on the couch and then the corner was a snake that had swallowed a person that he drew. I mean, it was just uh, layers and layers and layers of crazy making. So I, I you're, you're just, you're not alone. I mean, everybody's story, everybody has their own unique experience, but there's so many similarities, I think, between them. Um, but it can be just kind of reassuring to know that you're not alone in that. Uh, yes, okay, so Sir Style Counselor, that's what I was going to bring up. He'd asked if there's any highly empathetic people here. I think you're probably going to find that there's a lot. <laughs> a lot. Um, so I had not heard of the term like empath. Um, I had not heard of the term empath until probably, I don't know, probably about a year ago. Maybe I had heard of it. If I had heard of it, it was from the show Star Trek, (laughs) like where the counselor Troy, who was like an empath. But I didn't realize that that was like a real term referring to real people. And when I began reading about the term, it was, it was shocking. I'm like, oh, that's me. Like that is me to a T. So, I mean, if you're, I don't know how old you are, but if you remember the movie, The Never Ending Story, where the boy is reading the book and he's like getting freaked out because he's like, I think like they're talking about me. (laughs) because <laughs> they're, you know, they're, they're talking, like describing the room and they're describing like his name and everything. And that's exactly how I felt when I was reading about that. Like I haven't had a TV in, you know, close to eight years now. 
because I, I get, I don't like watching, you know, anything that's violent or, um, I, I have a hard time kind of separating my own moods from other people's moods. I'm just very sensitive to my environment. I don't like TVs. I don't like malls. I don't like real, I'm not a fan of crowds. Um, yeah, so there's just a lot. I mean, it just goes on and on and on. So, you know, <laughs> you're not, you're not alone. There's a lot, I think a lot of people in this community that would consider themselves to be highly sensitive or, or empaths. Uh, Sir Style says, Dr. Orloff, Empathy on YouTube. I'm going to copy that and then look it up. Yeah, I will check it out. It's interesting. Yeah, Postmodern says, I wish I wasn't highly sensitive or empathetic. Yeah. Yeah, I hear you, but you know, it's, um, I think once we can kind of balance that with a solid sense of boundaries and realizing who we are outside of like other people, then we really step into our power where we get so knocked. I mean, I get like this stuff, this stuff is not discussed and it's not taught. Frankly, it's a miracle that anybody's life works out to any degree. <laughs> like it just really is. So, you know, really realizing, you know, like this is the cool thing is if you are really truly empathic, then really stepping into understanding yourself, understanding your own emotions and where different things are coming from and relating to other people and, being able to hold your, your, like your, your energy, like holding your space and not getting knocked off by other people and, and being able to, you know, again, like kind of hold, hold, hold your vibration, like hold your energy to where if other people are feeling really low, it's not sinking you. It's like, you're not so sensitive. If anything, like you can stay here and they can be here and then you can, you can help like raise them up. And that's, I don't know. I know it sounds super hippie woo woo. Like if you're not into it, but it's, there's just, there's a, a lot to that. Yeah. Kevin says staying centered and grounded. Yeah. Diane says, I think the world needs caring, compassionate, understanding people. It can't be all ruthless narcissists. For sure, for sure. You know, being caring and compassionate, we have to realize that we are worthy of that as well. And so I think for so many of us, we've just been walking around out of alignment for a long time. I think the vast majority of people in the world are probably like 99.95% of them are and don't even realize it. And they just, they're wondering why their life is not working you know, if we're out of alignment, then, um, you know, kind of realizing, okay, what does it take to, to bring ourselves like back into alignment? And that like <laughs> moving forward from all of this is so much more than just healing. And that's, don't get me wrong. Like that's a huge step within itself, but the next level to all of that is really getting in tune with yourself, possibly for the first time ever. And that, it's just, it's really, really, really cool. Gosh. Lots of questions. Hold the key. Hold on. <laughs> Chat's going fast. Okay. Um, Uh, 
I'm kind of, hold on, I'm trying to read at the same time here. Um, and then I'm gonna, we're gonna go here in about five minutes. Oh, yes, Truth Seeker says, if you go inside your body to hold your inner child, there is power within that inner spirit. Yes, it's so true. And, you know, that might seem really, uh, <laughs> like, just kind of frou-frou, you know, or psychobabbly for a lot of people. But there's, so what people, like, the concept of the inner child, right, is basically who you were when you were a little child. That really is more like your authentic self. Like, what did you like? What did you dislike? When we were in tune with our emotions and in tune with, with our environment and and we had us we weren't afraid to to ask for things and we weren't we had we felt like worthy right like yeah i would like to have this or we spoke up and we were assertive and kind of before the world got to us and ground us down to fit us inside its box we were we we were our true self and so then as an adult it's kind of getting back trying to get back to that and getting reconnected with, with who we are, with our emotions, with our preferences, with our thoughts and our feelings and our actions and just getting everything back in alignment. So we're not making decisions based out of fear or based out of trauma or based out of the past, but we're based out of like who we are and what we're about. And you know, that can really, it can take time and it can be a challenge, but the discovery process, what's, what's cool about that is the magic doesn't like, you don't have to get totally fixed (laughs) and like in alignment with yourself before like, you know, the, the benefits and the magic in your life starts happening. I mean, even really just getting into alignment with yourself 10-15% 10-15% makes an ocean of difference and it can be really fun when you start building momentum when you start kind of peeling back these layers and questioning things like who am I and what do I really think about this and is this a belief that was passed down to me because of culture or religion or you know family or the community I grew up in or you know where did I get this from and do I still subscribe to this way of thinking you know, it's, it's just, it's a whole process of just getting to know yourself, but it's so worth it. It's so, so worth it. Hmm. That's a great question. Postmodern says, is it helpful to think of ourselves as empaths? You know, it might, it might be if you, I guess if you feel like you are, um, for me reading some articles about like kind of like traits of an empath kind of a thing really gave me a lot of insight. It just, again, like you you just kind of like, well, it's just me. Like I didn't, I didn't realize that there were other people out there that had a lot of these similar characteristics so to me it was very validating like I'm not alone in this like there's other people out there that that feel this way and um these are the challenges that they have and then of course if you can join some empath groups there's a handful of those on Facebook and um talking to other people it's just weird like that was a weird thing for me really realizing that empaths were a thing and that um We all had a ton of, I mean, there's a lot of empaths like that are like vegetarian that, um, you know, just very like have gone through abusive relationships that tend to be in, you know, caregiving type fields that, um, don't have TVs or don't like to listen to the news or watch TVs or be around crowds or, um, that are very sensitive to the different types of foods that they eat or, um, clothes that they wear or um, feel a deep connection to animals. There's just, there's a lot, like a lot, like a lot of, of different of character traits. 
it's interesting. So. And he says, is it really? Oh, where did it go? Okay, I lost it. And he says, oh, is it really the only way to pay back? Is it really the only way to get back at a narcissist that we live a better life than they do? Uh well, I think that's one of the ways. I think that's the biggest way. I think the other way would be to to pour that energy to to become what I call like an emotional alchemist. <laughs> so you're you're taking all of this pain and you're using it, you're transmuting it into something positive. And you're using it for this pain becomes um it can become your purpose, it can become your passion, it can become your power. And you're using it for not only your highest and greatest good, but where the magic really happens is when you start using it for the highest and greatest good of others. Then you're, you're really giving it a purpose and it's, it's so freaking rewarding. I mean, my goodness. And it doesn't have to be directly related to the narcissist. It's, you know, I, I choose to, to take what has happened to me in my life and, and I do this. But another person might be like, you know what, I'm going to take this pain, I'm going to use it as rocket fuel to help get me to this next level and that they're going to go, you know, I don't know, become an architect and design, you know, eco-friendly homes. And like, that's going to be their thing. And they're just so juiced by it. And they just, they take all this energy and they just, they go for it. So it's kind of, however you're going to take all of all of this energy and what direction that you're going to going to put it forth. My brother, he um was working at Starbucks. This was year this was years ago. Working at Starbucks, he was dating a girl. She was highly problematic. He was they broke she broke up or he she was cheating or something. He was devastated and he got so angry. He'd always wanted to be a personal trainer and um it was the event that gave him, he was so upset that it was just this drive of like, I've got to do something. And so I might as well do something positive. And he's like, he's like, my life's already destroyed. So kind of forget it. I'm just going to go for it. And he just went for it and is, does really, really well as a personal trainer. So he was able to take that energy and that pain and make it work for him. And, and you can too, it's just deciding like, what direction that you want to channel that in. Hmm. True Love says, Dana, I spoke with a man on the phone tonight for the first time. He says he loves animals, doesn't own a TV or watch TV, yet also hunts animals for food. <laughs> like Teddy Roosevelt, he said, with a trophy room. It sounds off. Well, you know, maybe time will tell. I think it's, you know, if you're feeling that something's off, it's a, a good thing to kind of go slow and to take a few steps back and to just kind of see to see for me I the trophy room with animals would be a deal breaker for me that I could not be with anybody that had animal anything all over the house like that would you know everybody's got their deal breakers I mean some people and this isn't you know not to make him bad or wrong it's just it's a lifestyle thing other people might be really into motorcycles where they're like, absolutely no, there's no way I would ever date a person that rode a motorcycle because it's too dangerous. Or, you know, everybody's got their little things that would be deal breakers for them. It just kind of comes with knowing, knowing yourself and like what works for you and what doesn't.
uh, P. Smith says, do you believe all narcissists had an injury of some sort as a child? I think my husband was just entitled by having a um, famous person, his dad being a famous person. Yeah, post postponer says, I used to think that there, I used to think that, but there are two ways to make a narcissist, trauma and coddling. Yeah. Spoiling a child, having a child grow up in privilege is by many, by many considered to be a form of abuse, which when I first read that, I was like, what? Like that, you know, really? But <clears throat> it's really because if a child doesn't develop properly, if they don't really, if they're not in tune with who they are and they're not able to build self-esteem and self-esteem comes from trial and error. It comes from trying something and falling down and picking yourself up and trying again and, and moving forward, you know, empty, empty victories. It doesn't build self-esteem. If anything, I think it leads to kind of this attitude of like this apathy And so if a child grows up where they have, you know, servants and they're just catered to and they never have to really try very hard, it's sad because then they don't, they they need, like they're, they're, I don't know, like there needs to be that resistance for growth to happen. So, but yeah, I think, you know, a lot of them come from either some sort of, traumatic childhood or a childhood where they're spoiled. And then there's kind of that X factor, which, you know, who, who, who knows, who knows? I think all of this is so much still like in their, their, uh, infancy with trying to figure out like the, the, the whole dynamic. I mean, this is just, yeah. Postmodern says you need adversity to develop grit. Yes. I remember, and I don't know if this is a true story or not, but I I like it all the same, where there's a scientist, I guess is, I forget what entomologist study studies bugs. And he is studying these, these caterpillars, you know, that have formed the cocoon and everything. And so he sees them, the cocoons like moving around. And so he decides, he's sitting there and he decides, you know what, I'm just going to help them out. And so he takes like an X-Acto knife and he cuts the cocoon thinking that he's just making their life easier, right? And then they're going to fly out. Well, what ends up happening is they, as soon as they find that slit, then they, they just fall out and they hit the table and they're dead. And he's like, what happened? And then he realized the purpose of them like beating their wings against the sides of the cocoons was to help strengthen their wings. And he was thinking that he was helping them, but by making it easier for them, he was actually hurting them. And I think there, there's a, that's a strong kind of analogy or correlation with actually spoiling children because it's, it's well, in, it's oftentimes well intended, but it's incredibly harmful later on in life because they just don't learn how to cope with, with things. And I think a a person's job as a parent, it's, it's not so much to protect a child from the world because the world is out there. It's more to, um, prepare a child for the world and be like, you know what, these things happen. These are the kind of people that are out there, but here, here's a whole tool chest full of, you know, skills (laughs) that you can use in order to navigate your way through life to where you're not relying on, you know, so that you're not 40 years old and, and, you know, relying on me to make you okay with life, like that you're able to become an adult and stand on your own two feet and, and be okay. And again, stuff's not really taught. Unfortunately, I would love to see that that change in our lifetime. Oh, uh, somebody was asking about the name that I was going to go look up. Dr. Orloff, O-R-L-O-F-F. And it had to do with empathy. I think that's the one you're talking about. So 
Um, okay, guys, I'm going to call it a night. I got to get to bed. Thank you so much for, for being here and for joining and for just supporting each other and all of it. So if you're new here, we do this every single Wednesday night and it's uh, 8.30 p.m. Eastern Standard Time here on YouTube. And if you have any questions for me that you want me to address on the show, you can email me at deardana at thriveafterabuse.com and I will do my best, okay? You guys take care. Have a fantastic week and uh, you guys matter. So just never, ever forget that. Okay, so lots of love to you. You are not alone. You are not crazy and you really can move forward and heal from this. So take care and I will talk to you next week.